right on time again. What's our streak now? So that's that's five days last week, two days this week. On time, gang. What's up, everybody? Happy 7 p.m. Uh, East Coast time. Welcome to another episode of Mastermind Academy. How's everyone doing? Let me. I'm still getting started. I just ate dinner real quick. Uh, spent a little time, just a tiny bit of time with the wife. So uh, just get myself together. What's up, Wisdom? I like that. Wiz Nindom. How you doing tonight? Molo, what's up? Glad you're digging the vibes. What's up, Supreme Sensei? Good to see you. What's up, The Greatest Rob? That's our BP. Good to see you. Best way to learn cloud, AWS or Azure. The best way to learn cloud is right here. It's like now, well, we do do cloud stuff. Um, so you can tune in on Mondays and Wednesdays for that. Uh, but I, AWS, if you want uh, a bigger, uh, you know, a, a bigger net of jobs, if you want a more opportunity, you go AWS, um, but there is a, you can probably have more lucrative opportunities within Azure because there's a less of a market for it. There's less candidates out there for it as well. Um, so yeah, I, I've seen some, some Azure jobs paying stupid money because it's hard to find the people that you need because more people are going into AWS, but still a dope platform. That's dope, Supreme Sensei. That's that's cool. Um, maybe one day I need to, I need to uh, do something up here. So maybe I'll see if if the wife will uh, want to do that one day while we're while we're streaming. That would be interesting. Rewatch streams, yeah, absolutely. Like go re go back over the streams, go back over the material. This background, no knowledge. Not important that you don't have any knowledge. This is designed for people to have no knowledge. Tonight, we're actually going to be going over, um, the stuff we're gonna be going over is fairly, um, I don't know, I always, I'm always, again, I'm confused on how the topics like these are gonna go over, so I didn't include a lot. Um, and what I was gonna end up doing is, we were supposed to do this last week, um, but I wanted you to see a little Linux first, so I'm glad we went over some Linux stuff, just because we will be diving even into some Linux stuff tonight. Tonight, we're gonna be going over bits and bytes and binary, uh, just kind of understanding those topics. This is more of the computer science aspect of things. Uh, it's I I'm gonna be upfront with you. It's not super important that you, you're not gonna need to be an expert at this stuff to be able to code, uh, to be able to go to a job and code. That's not what it's for, um, but it, it is good to have this base level understanding. Um, this stuff does come up involving these things, but uh, again, just good concepts uh, to, to be aware of. And I think it'll help you as we move forward inside of this course. Um, so don't sweat it if tonight it seems a little uh, tough, um, but I think it'll be, it's very light on, on concepts. There's only just a few concepts that are gonna come out of tonight. Um, 5K bubbles, and I don't know what to do with them. I have, so I need to learn about what to, how to set stuff up with the channel points. I'm gonna do that. I'm I'm adding more every day. <laughs> Once, yeah, I'm adding more every day. Um, I just the only problem is the only time that I really get to spend uh, doing stuff other than um, the lectures is like Friday and Sunday. Um, and I like to spend some time with my family, you know, because I do still work a full time job as well. Super new and don't understand the lingo. I can confuse. Yes, that is okay. One of the things that I said in the first class was. Hey, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Write those, those that lingo. I know it's gonna be wild at first. Write it all down. Grab you a, a pencil, piece of paper, or type it out on your computer. Uh, when we say some lingo, and you're like, I have no idea what that was. Write it down. Um, go look it up afterwards. Just and even when you look it up, it may not make any sense. You gotta start. Uh, you gotta the immersion. The immersion really, really helps. There's there's something to be said about it. Appreciate that the dev always coming in hot with the bits. I can't, I can't wait to be a nerd in this. I'm telling you, it, it happens faster than you think. Azure Fundamentals. I'm planning on doing some Azure stuff next year um, on here. Uh, I just don't know. I haven't, I know I've used Azure um, and I've done a bit with Azure, but I'm not, um, I don't know. I'm definitely not in, I'm not super well versed in Azure, but I do want to spend some time messing with the platform uh, and doing a similar cloud course that kind of covers more than just AWS or doing another track that covers Azure as well because it's a big one as well. There are a lot of Azure jobs by me compared to AWS. Yeah, so even in like, uh, I think it depends on where, you, it does depend on where you are because uh, like here in the Baltimore and closer to DC and stuff, there are a lot of government contractors. We all know the government loves themselves and Microsoft. There are, there are a fair amount of Azure jobs around here as well. Um, but they're paying a little more because again, it's a little harder to come by people who have Azure work experience just because like so many people have done stuff with AWS, at least in my experience, 
in this area so far. Um, even where I work, uh, we had one project that needed some Azure folks and we could we could not find anyone and like we could not find anyone in, in the price range that we wanted to pay. Uh, it was very tough. Um, and then we ended up just having people who knew AWS go learn Azure. For the Jester, I will check them. Um, I'll definitely check them. I'm trying to get on a schedule of check. I wish you guys could see how many just like channels of things that I'm in. Um, I'll try to get I'll try to get on there and check that out tonight. Nice LEDs. Yeah, we're getting a little bit fancier. Are you familiar with the Twitch language? Uh, I, everyone I know does Twitch stuff in TypeScript, I believe. Um, I think you can do it in a bunch of different languages. It's just web based APIs and stuff. So I think you can do it or whatever. When I first started developing, someone advised me to get on tour and on the deep dark web and read the threads. Uh, that's interesting. Um, very interesting. Deep web is an interesting place. Be careful on there. Uh, you can find some interesting things that you may, may or may not want to see. Um, okay. But I find that Twitch kind of works like that. Oh, huh, interesting. Am I using Emacs? No, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm not using Emacs. Um, I'm using Vim. Um, I use Vim for a lot of things. We'll probably be using VS Code here. How do you go about finding uh, coding projects? That's a really great coding projects is one of the toughest questions. The reason why, if you go online, that's like the first question people ask. And every I think everyone answers it poorly. Um, I think someone needs to sit down and create uh, beginner coding projects that are really beneficial um, because there's a lot of different things you can do. Everyone says, find the thing that you're passionate about and go ahead and code that. Like, bro, I'm just learning how to code. I'm not, I don't know what I'm passionate about. I don't know. I don't even know what I can do with the code. Like, I, I really hate that. I hate those answers, but I also, I'll be honest with you. I don't have a good answer for you uh, either. Um, some people say, go learn algorithms. Why well, I think that's value. Well, I think that's valuable. And we're going to learn some algorithms here. I don't necessarily think that's going to make you amazing at uh, coding. I think it's going to make you uh, really good at problem solving, which is a good thing, um, which I think is helpful. Um, but yeah, I think it depends on what you're trying to do, but I do think, um, I, I think we're going to take some time to figure out some good projects to actually work on. Um, I do recommend, you know, hitting up some of the websites, uh, that, that have the coding challenges and little projects and things, because, you know, at, in lieu of anything else, those are fun to work on. They can be tough. Um, but I do recommend that there's a, there's leak code stuff. There's project Euler or project Euler. And actually let's go to, let's actually go to the Academy view really quick. Actually, what's even gonna show? I don't even have my VM started. Oh, you guys can see my Windows desktop though. We can use this for now while my VM is starting. But there's a bunch of options there. What time is 7.08, cool. Yeah, we can keep, we can keep chit chatting for another few minutes. Cause like I said, tonight's topics are pretty um, chill. One second. What's, oh man, hold on. Let me make this, why is this so small? There we go. Now I can see <laughs> I am a cyborg, but that's okay. What's up? Welcome to the channel. Thank you for the follow. I know someone else just followed once it updates. Uh, I'll say what's up to you as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is like, I use a, uh, what is this program called? This thing, um, wallpaper engine. I think, I think I bought it on steam. Like all my wallpapers. I mean, all my screens have different wallpaper on them, but, oh, Actually, first, let me start up my virtual box just because it's going to take a bit to start. All right. Um, what were we just? Oh, yeah. Project. You oil. I think you pronounce it project oil. Now, I don't recommend people do that. Like, so th the problem is these are more like math problems. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to send you guys a bunch of resources, actually. Uh, the, the classroom link, if you hit exclamation point classroom uh you can get that but if you're talking about the slides for today no the slides for today have not been posted yet um something that we're going to be doing on here uh, something we're going to be using on here to practice our coding and to pick up some skills is uh exorcism.io so i actually have a team here on exorcism.io that we're going to be using to uh that we can participate together in to do some coding some uh coding challenges i like exorcism in particular, uh, because I think there's a good gradual, uh, escalation of intensity and difficulty, uh, where I think, I think that's where a lot of other sites fail. Uh, I think it starts off with things that are actually easy, um, or 
what what I would consider easy after you spend some time. They're going to be tough at first, um, but I do think they're considered like easy problems. Uh, the middle level ones, I think there's a good range in there, and the tough ones are actually pretty tough. Yes, um, I can create a channel on Discord for coding challenges um, for sure. And if the couple, the couple people I gave mods to uh, there, if you want to create that, feel free. Go ahead. Um, we can put some stuff in there. Um, this is not the current stream is. Oh, yeah, there we go. OK, um, I'll give you guys some other resources to practice some things, but I do think we should curate. I think it'll be great if we could curate here a good list of projects for people to practice. Um, I think we'll take out some time to do that. Um, but not tonight. Tonight is bits and bytes and binary and uh, also like an exploration of languages. Tonight you're gonna get to see, after we do the bits and bytes stuff, uh, which is gonna be, probably take up most of the time, uh, we're gonna explore some of the languages that are out there. Uh, there's some main ones that we're gonna be focused on, but I want you to be familiar with others. Um, and even though you don't know how to code yet, uh, we're gonna be writing some code in them. And I want you to just, uh, we're gonna be doing the same thing in a few different languages. And I want you to just start to like, I, I hope it starts to disarm you and it, heart, like, it starts to feel like, oh, okay. Like all these things are the same uh, or, or very similar. And uh, w again, all we're doing is providing instructions to the computer so they can automatically do a task. Um, and I'm hoping it, it can just start to get you in the right headspace before we actually start writing real code um, we'll start writing real code next week. Um, I think tonight we also, uh, no, we're not talking about that, but, um, we'll start writing. Um, I think uh, not next week, uh, on Thursday, uh, we have one second here on Thursday. We are, uh, we're learning about, uh, we're like hopping straight in to all the stuff. We're going to be learning about variables, um, displaying output. And we're also going to die. We're going to spend a solid amount of time, probably 45 minutes or so diving into Git and version control. Uh, so if you've been wanting to dive into Git, we're going to dive into that real early. You're going to learn how to write a teensy bit of code. And then you're immediately going to learn how to manage that, uh, and keep that stuff around and learn about all that. What's up, MG? thank you so much for the Twitch prime, uh, <clears throat> soul Supreme 93. Thank you so much for the tier one sub. Good to have you. Okay. Let's, uh, my VMs up. Let's, Get it in there. I'll share the links with you. We only got like five slides tonight. We're going to dive into the whiteboard pretty soon. I also was never using this uh, pillow for my I'm actually going to move the mic back because it's pretty comfortable. Um, move it down a little bit uh, for my chair. And I'm actually I usually never sit all the way back in my chair. And this is surprisingly comfortable. So I'd hope I don't fall asleep on you all. I love math. I don't really love math all that much. I'm OK with it, but I don't really love it. Try downloading Authy for Chrome, but it says it's no longer supported. Uh, I never tried it for Chrome. Um, I have it on my phone. I've never, I've never tried it for Chrome. That that might make it pretty good since Chrome uh, syncs between you know browsers. Okay, I'm gonna grab a little water. I'm super comfortable. Oh my gosh, mic extender thingy. I got this from. This is a Samsung one. It's, it's real cheap. I got this from uh, Micro Center. I think. Uh, yeah, I need a better, I want to get a better one, uh, cause it doesn't like, it's kind of stiff and the range of motion is, uh, I've seen some good ones. I've used some good ones before and they've got good, like tension arms and stuff and they're a little bit better, but like I paid like $20 for it a while ago, uh, but it's working. It works just fine for me. <laughs> you right. That's, that's great. You ran through the GitHub tutorial. Perfect. We're learning all about GitHub. Next time, that's funny that you had a repo there for five years. That is exactly how my um, career went. Uh, I, I remember the I kept trying to hop in and do new projects, and I had to learn. I had to try to learn Git like three times as well. And when I got in there, I was like, "Oh, I already have a GitHub account, and looks like I already pushed someone else's code up here before." And I didn't remember any of that. Okay, my stream is really buggy tonight. I'll check out the lecture tomorrow. Sorry about that. Um, it looks, let me actually, thanks for saying that. Let me pull up my metrics. We haven't dropped any frames yet, so I'm going to blame that on you. Uh, I'm going to blame it on you, but uh, I'm sorry about that. Hopefully it gets better. But let's do this. Bits, bytes, binary, and language exploration. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. That tagline has nothing to do with anything we're learning tonight. It felt good to put it there. I was I always try to think of taglines to put for these. And I remember when I was putting it there, I was like, you know what? 
this just feels right. So uh, pay no mind to that because again, it doesn't mean anything. And I think, what do we have? I think we only have five slides tonight. Yep, five quick slides. Um, but the problem is when you get into uh, days that are only five slides, uh, that means we're gonna be doing a lot of, uh, of concept, well, a little bit of conceptual thinking. So um, be open to it a little bit. Um, let's see. So bits, we talk about bits, bytes, and, bi and uh, binary. I probably, I maybe should have let off with binary, but I don't know. There's, there's a, it's kind of a circular flow here. But we're gonna start off with bits here. What is a bit? Remember, um, we talked a little bit about uh, how a computer worked, and we talked about processor CPUs, um, specifically the, the kind of the brain of the computer. Um, what that does is it takes in data. We already talked about it only understanding ones and zeros. Um, but that data, uh, the smallest form, the smallest unit of, um, of addressable data in a computer is a bit. So again, the smallest unit of data in a computer, uh, and it's, it's a, it's short for binary digits. So bits stands for binary digits. And again, we talked about binary before we're going to talk about binary again, but we're talking about zeros and ones. Uh, on and off, yes or no. Think about it as zeros and ones right now. It's not necessarily zero and one. Uh, those are just the things that are used to indicate uh, the state. It's more of a state um, than a, than you know anything else. But think about it as zeros and ones, on and off, yes or no, true or false. Uh, so binary, bi means two, two different things. That'll help you remember that in the future. And again, all it is is the smallest unit of data in a computer. Very, very simple. No background jazz. Can you guys not hear them? There's no background music. Oh, there's not. Hold on. That's whack. I can hear it in my headphones. Thank you so much for saying that. You know, we don't, I hate not having music. There we go. There it goes. Let me know if the, let me know if it's right. So funny enough, actually, if anyone's familiar with, uh, the versus battles that are going on, on, um, on Instagram uh, today, some people at my job, that's what we did today. We just, amongst each other, we just like had a, a little bit of versus battles. We set up some categories. My squad lost. Um, we did kind of squad thing because they grouped us by age. And what they did was they gave uh, everyone who's older than us, they only gave us songs from 2005 to now. And they had every other song before 2005, which, you know, severely diminishes our catalog of songs. But that's why I was, I was messing around with my sound to kind of do some of that, but lower it. All right. Uh, let's see. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Oh, you you like the? I, I, I'll keep it low. It'll be it'll be real. It'll be real light. All right. So back into it. Any questions about bits so far? Bits. The only thing you need to know about bits right now is it's the smallest unit of data in a computer. Uh, that a computer, yeah, it's smallest unit of data in a computer, and it's binary digits. That's what it stands for. And it's just binary again as zeros or ones on or off yes or no just a little bit we'll mess with it all right o off to bits so we're already almost through our slides now we got bytes um bytes are a collection of bits so you have bits which is the smallest unit so like a penny <laughs> like it's like a penny but bytes um are a collection of bits um but bytes are specifically eight bits. So over on the right, we do have an eight bit. Uh, we have an eight bit game uh, GIF here. Um, there's eight bit audio. You probably heard of eight bit audio, but eight bits is a byte. You've probably heard of uh, uh, yes, eight bits equals one byte. Perfect. You go all the I really like that you guys are putting together the notes in there. Uh, super copy and pasteable for everyone. Um, where's the puppy today? Is it running in the lights? It's not. She's not. She's downstairs chilling. Um, but yeah, remember that it's very important. Uh, this eight bits is a byte. Uh, this it, these things are actually important, uh, like to know kind of what a byte is, and the eight bits do make it up. You don't need to be a pro at it, but eight bits is super important to know. Um, half a bit is called a nibble. You'll never say that in your life. Um, so that's four bytes. I mean four bits. Um, four bits is a nibble. I know I've never ever heard anyone use the term nibble and. and ever um but it's something that's commonly talked about uh often uh, but yeah there we go half a byte is a nibble but eight bits equals a byte so smallest unit is a bit you put eight of them together now you have a byte any questions there 
pretty simple. But uh, <laughs> no, ooh. four bytes is a double word. All right. One more sip of water. I just ate dinner before this, so I'm just trying to. I'm still washing everything down. All right, uh, that's yes. Didn't think about it that way, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a nibble. Half a bite is a nibble. Interesting. I'm slow, and I just caught everything you all were talking about. As many times as I've like I've known this for a long time, I never caught it. Thank you all for uh, uh, ascending my mind to understand that. <laughs> now I get it. Okay. Wait. So is one bit just a zero or a one? It can be either one. Great question. So uh, a zero and a one is they're both data like that, that on and off state. It is both of those are data. Um, and so one bit can be either those two. Those are the only two options they can be. Only two options is one or zero and one bit can can be either one or a zero. So that was a, that's actually a really good question. And so now um, eight of those eight of those data items that can be ones or zeros put together is a byte. Okay, now here's where we're gonna spend a little time here. You're gonna learn binary tonight. You're gonna learn how to speak binary uh, and understand what it, you know, uh, how it gets turned into other data, but uh, binary. Binary, you know, means two different states, two things, by meaning two, like bicycle, two wheels, um, zero and one, on or off, true and false. A lot of people will always just tell you it's a zero and a one, which again, it's good for representation, but uh, that's not really what binary is. It's more of a state. Uh, that processor that we're talking about and the computer that makes decisions, it has these things called transistors. Uh, and these transistors uh, basically allow, they're kind of gatekeepers that allow electricity through um, uh, and kind of create these, these phases, create these states of on or off or, you know, of on or off essentially, uh, to determine the, the value. So again, uh, each bit, each piece of data can only be uh, two options and those transistors help uh, represent that. Um, and so again, binary ones and zeros, true or false. And then how do ones and zeros represent data? So that's what we're gonna learn tonight. Um, any questions so far about bits or bytes? Um, I'm gonna teach you how, I'm gonna teach you a lot about binary right now. You're gonna get to do a couple examples. We're actually gonna go straight over right now to the whiteboard. Uh, we haven't used a whiteboard in a while, but real fast, look at that, look how, look how fast it is. Already at 723, we've already gotten past the slides. Uh, so any questions about that so far? Ew. <laughs> big nibble is a bite. Yes, a big nibble is a bite, I guess, well, a double nibble is a bite. I get it. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so sad that it took me so long to understand your jokes. The types of people in this world that understand binary. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I. That's a good one. Man, I'm, you know, I'm slow over here today. Do I need VirtualBox to download a Linux like Ubuntu? Um, to run it, um, VirtualBox is what I would recommend. Um, if you're kind of new to Linux, is yes, download VirtualBox first. Um, install, install Linux on it. You can watch. The, if you look at the, if you go to my YouTube channel and you watch the DevOps uh, playlist, you can see how to do that in the very first Linux episode. It walks you through how to do that if you need it. Um, what about non-binary bytes? There's uh, tonight's binary bytes tonight. Does it slow down your PC? Uh, yes, it can. Um, yes, you are running an, an entire new operating system inside of your computer. Uh, it can slow down your PC, but you can you can select how much energy you want to give it to it. Hexadecimal. We're not going to talk about hexadecimal tonight. Um, I'll give you guys a great podcast called the Base CS Podcast um, that will give you some of that information. We're not going to need to know. We're not going to learn too much about hexadecimal. Uh, there's a number of those podcasts that are homework assignments or or resources for the homework. Um, so I will share that for you as well. So you can use any computer or laptop to run Linux. Um, yes, uh, except for Chromebook. Well, no, even Chromebooks. Yes, the difficulty of running it may differ uh, amongst some of them, but yeah. All right, so we're gonna talk about representing this data. How do ones and zeros, everything you're doing right now on your computer, on your phone, all this stuff, again, your computer only understands, your processor can only uh, you know, work through things um, if it's presented to it in ones and zeros. 
Uh, but how does that happen? And how does how do you turn that into the things that you're seeing on the screen? How is my voice coming through to you? How are you seeing the image of my face? Um, coming through what's up mmo gamer welcome to the channel uh, how are you seeing these things when uh with ones and zeros let's talk about that a little bit um so the way that you represent um information or data with ones and zeros let's say let's fill out a little let's do a little uh change the color here uh, i'm yoloing all of this by the way so i'll do a lot of erasing throughout this um let's say so we're gonna we're gonna represent a bit as this square right here the square is a bit right and then so how many, um, so if that's one bit, a byte will be, wow, that's a terrible square. Can I just like copy and paste? I don't know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so that's a byte. And so again, this is very, like you probably heard that your computer and you know, has a certain amount of gigabytes of data um, or can hold a certain amount of uh, certain amount of gigabytes of data, your RAM, you have a certain amount of uh, gigabytes of RAM. Uh, again, that these are these are just uh, these are uh, magnifications of these bits and these bytes. They're just you know thousand bits here, a thousand bytes there, a thousand megabytes here, and you get to some gigs. So it's a lot of stuff. Um, but this again, this one bit, we'll write it up here, and we'll write byte down here. Uh, but again, this can be either a zero. Oh, uh, well, let's delete that. Or it can be a nice little, I don't write my ones like this, but I'm going to for you all today. Or it can be a one, the on or off state. Um, first, we'll talk about uh, represent the representation of numbers. Uh, then we'll talk about the representation of letters. Uh, and then we can start to talk about how that gets converted even longer. So um, I want you to, um, so with one bit, how many, uh, how many numbers could you represent? How do you, if we said that these things get, we're, we're gonna use these to represent numbers, how many numbers can you represent with a bit? Really, you can only represent two numbers. Um, obviously you can represent, if we wanted to write the number one, what would that be in decimal form? It would be, so if we put it in a bit, it would be one. And if we want to represent zero, it would be a zero, right? That kind of makes a little bit of sense, right? But what do you do when you get to two? How do you represent a two. Uh, and so this is where it goes. This is where it goes into, um, I don't want to get too deep into math, even though it's not, it's not a deep math concept. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible because I don't think, uh, you need to know the difference between base two, base 10, uh, all that stuff, even though it's a pretty simple concept. Um, but, uh, all, all, what I'm going to do here is I should give you a, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out what I want to delete. Cause this is not delete. Well, so two, Two here would be, uh, not, actually we're gonna go backwards. So in a byte. Uh, so every time you need new data, uh, let's say this is the first item. So we're actually gonna move from the right side over here and we're gonna move left. All right, so if the value needed to be zero of this, uh, the only other thing that would need to be filled in is this. Essentially, these are all zeros um, at first. And say, and let's, let's act like we're using, delete, delete, delete. Come on, how do I make this eraser bigger? I don't know what I'm doing. Get out of here, get out of here. Let's delete all of this real quick. And so what you're probably used to is a number, um, you know, starting from the left over here and going to the right. Uh, think about your bit going from this side over here, the right side over to the left side, all right? We got that, so we're thinking a little bit different. Uh, so when the number is zero, um, th this byte right here would represent a zero value, but, um, because of the, the basis of these, uh, what is, um, there are eight things here. So binary is base two. Um, and so two, uh, to the eighth right here. So we're gonna do a little bit of exponents here. Uh, you can go through and you can use this to uh, determine the values that are here. So one, a byte can represent uh, 256 numbers. It can actually represent from zero, from the number zero, it's 255. You might say, how in the world can you do that? Um, again, you can do this um, by uh, utilizing the, the amount of combinations of the base of what you're doing. So we're, we're talking about base two, the eighth. So if we, this is all zero, if we wanted to make this one, um, and I'm actually gonna do this, I'm gonna make it a little bit cleaner. I'm gonna delete all this. Uh, I'm gonna show you this. So 
here is going to be your ones place essentially so let's make this box here i'm going to label it give me one because what's two to the first two to the first anything to the first power is one i believe so it's one so what is uh or two to the zero power i guess is one yeah, I told you I'm not great at math. Um, hold on. Two to the zero is one. Uh, two to the first is two. Two to the second is four. Eight. Sixteen. One, two, three, five. Thirty-two. Sixty-four. And one hundred and twenty-eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we got our eight boxes that represent uh, the amount of value. So again, the, what, what it represents is the amount of combinations of ones and zeros um, that you can have uh, going from right to left, inc inclusive of all of these things. So um, yeah, so we'll start. We'll, we'll stop there for a second. You probably have noticed. Um, maybe if you're not, if you're new to computers, maybe not. But uh. These numbers are very uh, significant here. If you, if you remember when uh, RAM was starting to get bigger in computers, or you remember uh, when hard drive space was starting to get larger in computers, these are the amounts that you used to have. Even e even RAMing your phones and stuff, you started with, uh, you know, comp uh, phones and computers that had two gigs of RAM, and then it had four, like four gigs of RAM all of a sudden, and then eight, was a common place for a long time. But what's common right now, 16 in a new computer is pretty darn common to have 16 gigs of RAM. Right now in my computer, I actually have 64 gigs of RAM uh, and I had 32 before that. So um, all this stuff is important, uh, again, because computers understand binary. Um, and so, the, you know, the, the this, is how they, this is how they work. Um, so this is how you can get there. Um, but yeah, so keep keep in mind those numbers right there. Yeah, you guys, you guys teach the math because I'm not the best at teaching the math. Two to the power of zero is one, correct. Two to the first power. So two times two to the zero is one. Two to the first is two. Two to the second, four. Two to the third, eight, 16. On up. Again, we, we're, we're using that too. Um, okay. So when you have these, all these things here, imagine by default, they are all zero. So if we want to represent the number zero, what is zero here? Um, all of these are going to be zero. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's going to represent the number zero. So now if you want to represent the number one, we, we, we already said we figured this out. So all the spots are going to be that, but the one spot is now going to be one. All right. So that makes sense. It's like, Hey, I got a big number here. Uh, one will go ahead and give me the value I want. What if we want to go to two? What do you think that we would do? Some people might say you just add another line here. So maybe you're going to add them up like tallies. Not quite. Again, look at the uh, look at the value here. You can use this chart. You can use an outline like this uh, to really represent uh, what the value is actually going to be. So these are the actual number of values. Again, they're also not only the, the number of values, they're also the amount of combinations that you can make from this end over here to the right. Um, and so increasing a number again doubles that um doubles that amount but uh so to make it two like let's say if we wanted to make it two if we want to make this number two now uh the way we make it two is one, uh we would give it the two value we make this one and then this one be zero why because again this is in the two spot here um and so the number two can be represented by this byte right here. A one, an, an on state. And again, this, these are not ones and zeros. An on state in the twos spot. And the twos column is going to give you that representation of the number two. Okay. So what do you think would happen if we, what do you think the number value would be if we deleted this and we made this one a one? What happens if we make that one a one right there? What is the number value now of, of this byte? What is this byte uh, representing? It is representing the number three. Why is it representing the number three? Uh, because the two state, this two spot is on and the one spot is on. So you can essentially add those things together. Okay, so it's not like a 21. It's not like a, you know, it's not a 12, it's not a 21. It is, you, you add them together. So it is a, the two's value is on 
and the one's value is on, so three. All right, so that's, that is how you represent three and ignore my three. I'm writing on an iPad that's almost straight up. I should lay it down uh, so that I can write a little bit better. So let's say we wanted to make this one four. Whoops, oh man, I'm struggling here. Man, the, the I need to get a new uh, app that keeps my uh, the eraser there when I tap it. So if we wanna represent four, right now this is representing one, how do you think we represent four? Represent four, we know we have a four spot here, a value of four, and so we turn that we turn that spot on, we turn that value on, so we say that one's a one, and we turn everything else off. So we get four, and, and so on. So let's jump up, let's jump up a, nu a number first. Let's, let's, let's go from, you know, if we wanted to make it five, we would just turn this on right here. Ugh. We'll turn this one on right here because four is on and one is on. So that equals five. We got, yeah, we got four over here and we have one over here, which makes it five and again, so on. So if we wanted six, we would turn on the four and the two and we would remove the one um, and so on. But what if we wanted to do something like, um, what if we wanted to do something like delete all these? Wow. Let's say we want to do something like 63. How would you do 63? Take a look at it for a little bit. Look, look around. Essentially what you're trying to do here is you are trying to find the combination of numbers up here that will, when added together, will equal 63. And you want to turn those on. So you want to find the combination of numbers that equals the number that you'd like and you want to uh, and you want to uh, turn those turn those numbers on again. Everyone's already thrown it out there. Um, so it looks like 32 plus 16 plus eight plus four plus two is 63. How would you more have easy, like how would you have known that very quickly for someone brand new to this? Um, how would you have known this super simply? The way that you could have at least tried to figure this out super simply is, um, again, the number of combinations that you can make uh, is, uh, the highest number you can have is in the box that you are currently at. Um, not, not the, sorry, I'm sorry. Not the highest number of combinations, um, but the, the amount of combinations you can have is, is started from this box. So, you know, if you turn this box on that the number is gonna be 64, you want less than 64. So you can already um, see that you're not gonna be turning on this box or this box. You already know that uh, because again, as soon as you turn on 64, that gives you 64, uh, that represents at least the number 64. So if we just want 63, we know that, you know, maybe we don't know right off the bat that we want to uh, do most of them, but uh, you can start doing some math here. So you can add up, uh, you can might start with 32 because you kind of want to start with your highest numbers and you want to say, you know, what is 32 plus 16? What is that? That's 48. So you're like, okay, I'm getting there. What's 48 plus eight? and that's 56 and you say I'm pretty close and 56 plus four uh, is uh, 60. Um, 60 plus two is 62 plus one is 63. So there's actually gonna be zero here, a zero here and we're gonna fill in all the rest. So we need a 32, 16, an eight, a four, a two and a one. So that is your binary representation of the number 63. Again, same, what, what if you wanted to do something in between and go a little bit higher? What if you wanted a number like 146? Take a look at that one and let's try to do that one. That's higher than the number that we have here. Um, but how do you think we could do the number 146? And so binary practice is fun. Uh, there's a, on the quiz this week, there'll be a number of, uh, it's like this quiz is kind of long um, because we, this, the quiz for this week is kind of is longer than at least the horizons one from last week um, because there are a number of practice problems for binary on here. Just cause again, I think it's a good tool to have. Um, there's a number of questions about binary, number of questions about something we're gonna learn in a second, uh, doing some like ASCII conversions. Um, 
But yeah, you're, you, you'll get some practice with this. So don't sweat it if you're not getting it right now. Add another bit. That is a that is a good answer. I really like that is the from what we've learned so far, what we've looked at, that is a very reasonable answer. Um, and I like that a lot, actually. Um, but another bit does not actually it doesn't actually do what you think uh, like that. that. That does make sense, though. I can see how you got there. But a one bit can represent, like I said uh, a little bit earlier, one one bit can actually represent two hundred and fifty six different. Um, different combinations, uh, different numbers. Um, it's really only the number zero through 255, but you know, zero is a number. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it's inclusive of that. So 256 representations is what a single byte can, um, represent. And so how will we do this? And I don't know how to do this offhand. I'm going to do it just like you. I can say, all right, I'm probably going to want to start with 128. Maybe, uh, most likely I'm going to want to start with 128. So let's see, um, 128. You know, uh, if we add 64 to it, we're obviously going to be over 146. Um, so what number on here can we add to this to make it as close to 146 uh, as possible without going over? So let's say 128. Uh, so let's put a one here just to get that placeholder in. Uh, let's say um, 32 is going to take us into the 50s. Uh, 16 is going to take us to 30, 40. Uh, that might take us to there. So uh, what, 16, 38 plus six is 44. So that'll take us to 144. So adding... Uh, so we don't want 64 because that's going to take us over 32 adding 32 to 128 is also going to take us over so zero we don't want that uh, but turning the 16 on takes us right there it takes us to 144 um if i'm doing my math right um so it sounds like we want that and we just need another and we need two more um if we have 144 so zero zero one in the two spot and zero i think that's right let me know if i'm wrong let me know if I am wrong here. 128 plus eight plus two. Am I tripping? Well, 128 plus eight will take you to 36 plus two will take you to 38. Am I doing this right? So what? Yeah, so you can subtract two. I like that a beautiful. So 146 minus 128 is 18. And then so 16 and two, uh, and that's what I did over here. So these are the ones that we turned on. So you just want to turn those things on. So um, because I knew that I would like, because like I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a computer scientist. We're going to be learning the basics of computers of computer science, but we're going to, we're going to be learning a lot of coding, but we are going to be diving into um, a lot of the algorithmic things. Um, and that's mostly why we're, we've highlighted the computer science portion of this because I know I'm not the great, at the best at explaining that I actually gave you guys an entire course from Harvard as a part of your homework, uh, where they do an amazing job actually of presenting this exact information. But I think it's fun going through some of the examples right now because uh, they go through them so a little bit fast. You can ask questions about it, but I highly recommend you do that. Yeah, that CS50 course, that that one hour course is, is phenomenal. Um, it's what I use to learn uh, binary, to at least understand binary. And again, it's not crazy important. I already kind of understood the the some of the concepts of how bits and bytes work because I, de I dealt a little bit with computer hardware, um, but I didn't really understand, you know, how to represent data with, with these things or how will you use those bits and bytes to do that. Um, oh, that's dope. I, I'm considering auditing that course, um, but I don't know if I, I don't know if I, I don't know. I don't know if I really need to, um, just because of the things that I, I've kind of already know what I'm trying to go into, but maybe, maybe one day I will. It is a, it's a great course, or at least the first hour is. But yeah, so I would say practice with a couple, uh, maybe try a couple other numbers. Um, we're only going to focus on one byte today, uh, but other bytes uh, will allow you adding, you know, additional bytes will allow that number to grow. Um, so yeah, so just know that as well. Um, but any questions about that so far? Pretty, like binary is, is cool. Uh, it can, again, be a little intimidating because it's, it's how the computer uh, processes things. Um, but being able to kind of figure that out again is once you know these, if you can memorize these values up top or you can understand wh what those values are and how to get to those, um, you know that there are eight bits. Uh, a bit can have two values. So, you know, you do two to the eighth and it can help you get the numbers that are up top. Uh, it can always help you 
understand how to convert that binary into different values, into number values, uh, and a number of values. All right. So if that's how you represent uh, numbers, uh, and, and you know, we, we know how to represent numbers. How do you represent letters? And how do we represent text? And so to do that, we have actually, I think there's one more, there's one more slide. We do that with something called ASCII and we're gonna go and ASCII in a second. Just wanted to give you that intro to the new section, even though it's a simple section. Um, and we're going to write some code to kind of see this in action. But uh, ASCII, the American, I don't know what ASCII stands for. Maybe we should put it in the title real quick. It's like the American symbol something, I don't know. Appreciate, uh, appreciate the bits, uh, Mont Simba. Thank you so much for the cheer. Really appreciate it. It is the American standard code for information interchange. Not important. I mean, ASCII is important. Knowing what ASCII is, is very important. Uh, and code, we're, one day we'll talk about encoding as well. Uh, encoding is very important um, in programming. Uh, this isn't encoding. This is something that encodes the data. Um, and let's move this down a little bit. Uh, but it's very important. But you don't need to, you do not need to memorize that it is that it means this. If you can remember it, great. It'll make you sound smarter when you talk to someone. But like I said, I just looked it up because I've heard it before and I just didn't memorize it because you don't necessarily need to. Bro, why did you guys let me? This is your fault. Your fault. Thank you. I'm uh, one day we're gonna get good at this. We're gonna get good at changing the screen properly. I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much. I'm struggling. You know, I struggle some days. It's okay. It's all right. We struggle together. But ASCII, if I didn't, you know, if I didn't say anything, then you wouldn't even have known that I just put that title there. Uh, I had ASCII there, but I didn't know what it stood for. Um, but this is what ASCII is. Uh, here's an ASCII table. There are a number of them if you Google them. But uh, this is the way that uh, we have decided, at least this is one encoding where we have decided on the method for uh, for trans for translating this binary data and these numbers into uh, other information, uh, text in particular right now. And so, because we can make numbers easily with binary, um, we decided to give text uh, and symbols, letters and symbols, we decided to give it a number value. And the American standard code for information interchange is only one of those standards. So this is not the end all be all. This is one way. Um, and it's pretty, it's probably the most common here in the United States. Um, you know, uh, or a lot of places actually probably the most common uh, method of encoding um, data from binary. So we're gonna talk about that in a second. What's the highest number it can go? Uh, the highest number, um, what are the, so I think that depends upon um, the amount of like bytes you have available. Like that's why gigabytes of things matter. But um, there is a theoretical limit. Um, highest, highest. Um, there's like a theoretical limit and that's why they're, they wanna do stuff with quantum computing. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Cause I don't even want to like highest binary number doesn't really make anything. It depends on how many bits you have. Um, is the maximum positive value for a 32 bit signed integer. So again, the bits matter. Um, so every time you get to a new, you know, amount of bits, the bigger the number can go, the more uh, options you have. So, you know, there's no, I don't know there's, I don't think there's a true maximum, but again, if you have 32 bits, this is the highest number you could have. If you had 64 bits, that number would go uh, would go up. Unsigned is a thing. So um, you guys see what they say here with uh, integers and unsigned integers. Uh, we'll talk about those later in the course as well, because uh, these are data types in a number of languages. Um, but signed just means that uh, sign on the front, that positive or negative. Um, you know, uh, unsigned integers can only be uh, positive, um, because there's no sign. Um, but yeah, but yeah, it depends on how many bits you have to be, to set the maximum number. Um, yeah, there's some interesting things about, uh, 
computational maximums period um in computer science i again i'm not an expert on those things um but yeah it's pretty cool one day we'll get into hexadecimal which allows us to also represent these things in a different way um but we're not going to talk about hexadecimal tonight because i do think hexadecimal will be confusing to you uh, all right so ascii this table that we have look it's just it's just turning a number value into a letter so it's taking that number value and encoding it to a letter um and so you can see here this is probably kind of small but you can see that the number uh the letter a the le the capital a value uh is 65 the number 65 is the representation of the capital letter a and the capital letter k is represented by the number 75 uh, and these are different from lowercase and uppercase so 97 is a lowercase a um and q lowercase q is 113. so uh, what happens when you type something into the computer uh when you hit the k on your keyboard uh that signal goes through usb cable or you know wirelessly uh to your computer it actually does uh it actually gets like processed and put in a ram for for a the shortest amount of time uh, passed back to the processor. The processor um, takes that in, it gets passed in as a number value. So as soon as you do that, it gets encoded um, as the number 72 or something. Uh, and, and what is 72? It's a capital H. So you have to type in shift H. That will get encoded as the number 72. Your computer will know how to, uh, it will then you know encode that onto the screen and stick the letter H up there for you. Um, so a lot happens behind the scenes, but every time you type in a letter or, or for a letter to be processed, it is, uh, it's actually given as a number uh, instead. So um, let's see this in action. And we'll do this with a number of languages. Let's do this. Let's go to the Go Playground. And there are plenty of times, uh, there are some interesting times when you can use this, uh, you know, you can use the fact that these are numbers to uh, convert to letters to numbers for certain tasks. Uh, one of the most common things people do with it is um, to ensure that there are, uh, if, sometimes if you wanna ensure that a number, uh, like let's say you have an input field on a website and on that website or on that form, uh, you're only allowed to put in letters and numbers. Uh, a way, a way that you could ensure that all of the letters and numbers that are that someone types in are you know letters and numbers and not symbols one of the ways that you can confirm that is to ensure uh, of the ensure their numbers uh ensure what the the value of their numbers so uh letters only go from 65 to uh to 122 um and numbers are between 57 and 48 48 and 57 are numbers um, so you can actually check to say, hey, is every letter that's in here, you can convert it into a number. Um, and then you can say, hey, it, is this number value in between, you know, 69 or 66 or 65 and 122? If it's not, I know that it's not a letter and you need to go ahead and give me some new data. Um, but yeah, there's a number of different ways. We'll see that real time. We'll practice with that as well. But something like Go, um, Go has something called runes. Um, so I can actually get the number value of a letter. So I can type in something like, uh, I think rune will do it for me. I never remember a uh, rune of like the letter E. So what do we think that'll give us? Uh, if I wanna get the number value of E, let's, let's look at our table. And again, you can just Google an ASCII table. Maybe there's clearer ones to see. Um, let's click on one and see if we can find a, a good one that's easy to see from the web. Letter E. Lowercase should give us 101. And I might have to put that in uh, single quotes and not double quotes. Uh, yes, rune single quotes. I don't even think I need to do that. It's 101. So it gives us the number value 101 right here. Uh, and the same, I can do the same thing, uh, I think. Not with rune, I need to do. Can I just type it into a string? Um, let me see here. How do you bring one? Do I have to put that as a uh, trying to think? There's a there's a there's a method to convert um, an integer into a rune or a string literal. I think you can do it in Python as well. Let me just see. 
See, you never remember these super obscure items. Oh yeah, it's character. That was dumb. I definitely knew that. Oh, that's definitely character. Character 101. And if I run this, um, it's definitely character. Or can I not do it in a print line? But uh, let me see. I'm gonna Google it real quick. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I think, hold on. First off, I think I can actually do. I think even if you don't want to do it as a rune, I think I can do like bite as well, which makes a little more sense because we're learning about bits and bites. Um, I think I can do like bite A instead. And but that gives you the value 97. And again, E will give us 101. Um, as well. Um, but yeah, and then, then Python, Python has a couple as well. I'm just messing around right now. Um, I think you can do it in Python. I never remember in Python either. Let's see. They, they have like a, they have a, E, they have something like this. I'm gonna Google it a second. I'm trying to see how much I remember about this stuff. These are things that I've never had to do on a job. And so I do want to, I do want to express to you sometimes when we're doing some things, um, one, you'll see me mess around because I think you need to not be afraid to mess around and not look it up all the time. Like I'm going to look it up in a second. Um, but I, I'm going to try to, to point out some of the things that we're going to be learning in this course that, um, are job related concepts. So like, Yes, there are a lot of engineering software engineering roles where enco encoding is very important. Um, being able to convert data types and understand that properly is super important. Um, but the the methods and the situations when you're going to be doing these are going to be uh, they're going to make a little more sense once we get to the algor algorithmic portions um, of, of the course and kind of understanding that there. <laughs> Most people's, I know some people are gonna get mad at me about this. Most people's day to days uh, with programming, um, a majority of positions are not, uh, nope, I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it because I don't want to uh, put forth bad things, um, but I'm not gonna say it. Um, but yes, I think this is uh, for a character. I think I can do like 97 here, maybe that's better. Yeah, it's not gonna give me A. I don't know how to do it from a, I don't know how to do it. Python convert uh, character to int. Python, look at that. So you just Google it and you get the answer you want. And let's say I want to convert an integer to a character and vice versa. It looks like they give us both. So CHR um, will, in 97 will give us A and ORD. I don't get it. What's ORD mean? Does anyone know what ORD is short for? Just for my own knowledge. I do not know. ORD, not 97, ORD A. Can I just give it the character? Nope, I gotta stringify it. Okay, interesting. So you can convert back and forth, but I'm only doing, I'm only messing around with this right now uh, to show you that these the computer knows these things have number values this encoding um is it also allows this and a lot of times you are going to get uh ascii by default so ascii is one type of encoding there are other types of encoding where you may not get the same if it is encoded differently you may not get the same number that we get here uh, lowercase a in a different standard may not be the same value um, it's also worth noting that things like symbols um, are this way as well. So are things like emojis um, and things like that. They are represented by these number values as well, but those number values are a lot higher. That's the reason why people can't just release new emojis. When you're waiting around for that new emoji, remember everyone was hyped about that taco emoji coming out. Uh, the reason why they're like, the reason why there's a whole standard around emojis is because we as, as a civilization need to decide on a way to represent uh, these things so the computer knows what to do. So when you're typing that stuff into your keyboard, um, it, again, it's represented by a number um, and you, you know, we, we need to decide on this thing so that your computer knows what to do. Order of the SIE, I don't know, ordinate, ordinal number? I don't, maybe, 
I was wondering if anyone knew for sure. Everyone's asking, everyone's asking me if that's the right answer. I don't know. Those are things that don't make sense. PowerShell uh, OS. It was nice. It makes sense. PowerShell is cool. Do I check marks to a cell? This is also how people add it. Yes, check marks to a cell. Again, it is a number representation. So, um, you might you might uh, be confused about like why uh, some applications, um, yeah, actually yes, the way you add the check marking cell absolutely is is this as well. Um, some of the encoding and applications might be different. Uh, applications uh, are actually allowed to like they can actually overtake. Uh, they actually inter some of them intercept the encoded value to uh, redirect that to a non-standard thing. Uh, so that's why some applications you use may have some really cool features and really cool symbols and things that you can do, but you can only do them in that application uh, because it's taking that input, um, that common input, and it is uh, it is outputting a standard that is not is outputting information that's not standard. But yeah, so it does stand for ordinal, ordinal data type. Let's read about that real quick. Let's learn together. In computer programming, an ordinal data type is a data type with a property that its values can be counted. Interesting. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, man, I haven't talked about, I haven't brought up the word ordinal. I haven't like heard the word ordinal in a long time, but that makes sense. One one corresponds with positive integers. For example, characters are ordinal because we can call A the first character, B the second. Nice. Now you all are experts on ordinal data types. You've learned your first, well, third or fourth data type, but ordinal data types. I like it. Thank you for looking that up and finding that. All right. That, whoa, Inception. I didn't even know this was behind here. That's going to confuse me. Close this, close this. Um. Yeah, and so th maybe we should talk about, nope, nope. I, I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna keep it right there for, for that. Now, um, at, do you guys have any questions about, again, the bits, the binaries, um, the, the bits, the bytes, or the binaries, uh, and, and kind of how that data is translated into numbers uh, or letters and things like that, basically, uh, everything else is represented by these numbers and these combination of numbers and letters. Uh, there are a number of other encodings uh, that kind of escalate to be able to get to all the things that you see on your screen. But a lot of things you see on your screen are, are just bits and bytes and binary um, as well, um, like kind of raw. Um, so any questions about that so far before we get into uh, the kind of the kind of deep exploration of some of the programming languages and um, kind of how they work together. I know you just saw, we just like dive between Go for a second and then Python, um, even though we didn't really do much with them. Uh, we're gonna dive into them a little bit deeper. We're gonna talk about, um, uh, what are we gonna talk about today? The target uh, targeting for, targets for uh, compiled languages, uh, what a target is um, and kind of how that differs between certain things um, and kind of what that is. Uh, we're gonna go over an overview of like, a lot of the common languages and we're gonna see how they like kind of how they work and how they differ and like we're gonna write you know little bits of programs and a lot of different ones so we can see kind of what they do we'll, di we'll dive into a bunch of different interpreters um yeah and kind of just kind of just explore before we get started to kind of get your feet wet on some of the things that we're going to be going over you're going to get a little of a intro onto a lot of things that we're going to go over so you'll see us use um we'll see us print some output and you'll see us write we'll do some variables and things like that but uh, yeah, that's what we're gonna be doing next. Like I said, tonight you should be out of here pretty early. How would you illustrate a number like 800 in binary? Great question. Uh, that you would just need more, uh, you would just simply need more bits or bytes. We, we need more bits, therefore you need more bytes. Um, but 800 in binary, um, we'll pull it up instead of, I don't wanna draw it on the iPad because I'm gonna save this uh, thing over here. Uh, ignore this for now. Um, let me, I want I want you to see the full one on what it will look like. And here we go. Um, and this is because the numbers will increase the value uh, as you go up. And so they start to lay it out here, um, just like we did the 256, but what is double of 256 as you go up the, uh, as you add a bit, um, as you add a bit, you add an, another number to that exponent at the top. So instead of two to the eighth, 
um, you know, we add more, you know, now you have two to the 16th, those top layers uh, change a little bit. So those categories change a little bit. So this is gonna go all the way up to, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So there are 10, there are 10 bits here, uh, 10, 10 bits. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, there are 10 bits that took, that took to make this. What does that mean? It means it took a bite and it took half of a nibble to make that. Um, to make that, and again, as you go up the number, you still have the, uh, the one, the two, the four, the eight, the 16, the 32, the 64, the uh, 128, the 256, the 512, and the 1024. Uh, so it goes all the way up to 1024. So again, all you do is um, you take that two to the whatever number, however many bits you need, um, and you operate exactly the same. So 800, no different, not super hard to, to figure out. The hardest part is figuring out which number is next. As you start to get bigger, um, you know, doubling those numbers can get, uh, you know, maybe you can't do them in your head. Nope. I do not use ad block. Um, I used to use it because it was great, but then I started to um, frequent a few people's sites that uh, that I wanted to support. Uh, so I cut the ad blocker off and now, you know, I just leave them off. Um, I'm not worried about a fatty liver to be 100% honest with you. Um, so I'm, you know, maybe I need to start going to more sites like this so they can start sending me better ad choices. I also have no idea what this is and it looks disgusting. Um, but my wife is a nutritionist, so maybe they're going off of our IP address and she does look at stuff like this. So I wonder, sometimes I do wonder how they get some of this stuff, but no ad block. Sometimes it's exciting. Maybe we'll find something we like one day. Um, but yes, that's how you would represent a number. And again, down here, it's nice. It looks like they're showing you all this or some of the 16 bit numbers and you know how many bits it takes to be able to get to the number that you care about. All right, now we talked about, last time we talked about, uh, not last time, but we've talked about so far, interpreted languages versus uh, compiled languages, statically typed languages versus dynamically typed languages. Uh, and we took a look at a, at a quick little graph of, uh, of the different languages, different programming languages. What we're gonna do uh, really quick is we're gonna take a look at some of the uh, most common dynamic languages, some of the most co uh, the most common uh, static languages. Um, we're gonna take a look at some some of the syntax. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some of the benefits um, and the the pros and cons of some of them as well. Um, this was I think a homework assignment week one. There was a uh, a page with a list of these languages, and that's the link I was looking for. Bootcamp curriculum decoded week. It was week one or two. I think it's week one. Let's pull that up really quick. Um, no, it was in the homework actually. Uh, let's go to classroom. Ah, there we go. Y'all are fast, way faster than me. I didn't remember where it was. Oh, uh, whoops, I clicked on it on the wrong. I forgot this is my virtual box, so I need to copy it and paste it here. Now, why are we doing this? Um, we are doing this because I think it is important, especially up front. I think one of the things that uh, that hurt me the most when I first um, when I first took a computer science class, which I did terrible at, is uh, they, we did cover a bunch of languages. We covered a bunch of languages, but I think when it, when you start teaching concepts in a language um, before having some familiarity uh, that that the languages are different, but ultimately similar. Um, it made it very hard. It made it very hard for me to step out of one and into the other. Like I think the first like two or three things we did, we did it all in Java. And then one day they just switched us over to Python and out of nowhere to do some stuff. And they're like, yeah, just do it in Python. And it was like, bro, this is like, 
this is not the, like I don't even understand what's going on here. I don't know how to run the program. I'm not doing anything like that. So um, I just want to give you a little context into how some of these things go. Um, there are a lot of programming languages on this list, a whole lot. Uh, the ordering of this, I don't know when this guy wrote this, um, but the ordering of it, of it, I don't think there's any particular order. Uh, I don't think this is like an order of popularity, or maybe it is, that's why they're numbered. List is just a list of 43 programming languages. The top ones from 2018, small number of languages that don't have any jobs. Okay, so he did like a, whatever metrics he used, this is what he came up with. Um, but real quick, we're gonna take a look at Python. We're gonna take a look at Ruby. We're gonna take a look at JavaScript. Uh, we're gonna take a look at Go. Uh, if I can get the JVM installed, uh, we're gonna take a look at Java. Uh, we started with C Sharp and it was a good choice. I, I hear really good things about C Sharp. Uh, I messed with C Sharp a little bit. I think it's great. The the problem, the problem with C sharp are is one people's avert people's aversion to uh, anything Windows, um, and also uh, it's a closed source language. Um, I'm pretty sure it still is. I'm pretty sure it's still closed source. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to stay away from closed source languages, uh, not for any particular reason. I think C sharp is great, um, but yeah. Oh, it's not anymore. I know. I know the .NET framework is open source, or at least they have a .NET Core, which is open source. Um, but I thought C Sharp was. Oh, okay, that's cool. Then maybe we might get it. Elixir's cool. Um, Elixir's cool as well. I don't know any Elixir, so maybe we'll try to do something with Elixir. What is is Elixir? Uh, is Elixir static or dynamic? I, I don't know. I know you can make some cool web apps with Elixir, so I'm assuming it is dynamic. Um uh interpreted let's find out oh it's a compiled language uh it behaves like an interpreted language the key difference between ruby or elixir however is that elixir does compile the files and persist modules hmm, maybe we'll do something with elixir tonight as well especially since it'll be fun because i don't use elixir all right let's do this so we should have all these downloaded for class? No, no, you shouldn't. Um, the only programming languages we're gonna be using in this class are JavaScript. So you need to download Node.js. Um, you need to download uh, Go. We don't need to download any of these actually, but Go is what we're gonna be using in Python. Those are gonna be the three that we're focused on. Uh, you can actually probably find somewhere online to do to use all of them. So the Go Playground is a place that we can do a bunch of stuff with Go. So if I just wanted to print, you know, the a nice little hello world app. Uh, you can do it right here inside of the Go Playground and it's no biggie. Um, there's probably, let's see, like JavaScript, you could probably do with inside the console if you wanted, but uh, you know, uh, JavaScript. I wonder if I can just type in like JavaScript Playground. I don't wanna type in like online editor because I feel like then you'll know, code playground, this is nice. Let's see. Ugh, this is a, uh, I was trying to avoid uh, sending you guys places like this. Cause I think it can be confusing. Like like this, this kind of just threw me off uh, a little bit, but let's see, how do I run this? Let's click run, nothing came up. Oh yeah, it did. Yeah, see that's like, it's like hard to, hard to use. Where else can we do? Yes, you should be lost, we're not. We're not, uh, we're not doing, we're not really doing anything right now. I am, I'm messing around. I'm sorry about that. I know it's making it hard to follow. Nothing I'm doing right now, you should be, you should be following. Uh, we're just, we're just seeing if there's a plate, an easy place for uh, people who don't want to install this or, or have to fight with installing these different languages. If there's an easy place for you to kind of hop in and play with the code, I've never used this. Uh, so I'm gonna click start coding over here. Oh, this is nice. So you can choose whatever you want. Oh, this might be great. This might, we might stay right here then. Uh, so if I want to go to Python, create a rebel. And then, just gonna guess, uh, over here I can type in, um, you know, X equals one, Y equals two, print X, plus Y. 
All right, we wrote a sweet math program. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna explain it to you. Um, but did I just run this or can I three or can I run it like can I actually type it in? Python three. Uh, oh, this is the actual interpreter over here. It just runs the interpreter. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, well, if you can, uh, I like this actually. So if you want to some try out some stuff tonight, and you don't need, you don't have it installed, hop over to REPL.IT. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, I wonder how this, how do I change the language? How does this handle different ling, uh, like a compiled language? Do I have to build it first or does it run compile it for me? So like, what if I go to, I don't know how to use this. I'm just, I'm gonna start coding. Make a new, oh, the little plus over there. So I don't know at all. What were we doing? Uh, Elixir, is that on here? It is not on here. Oh, yes, it is. I don't I don't know anything about Elixir. I know nothing about Elixir. So an Elixir, um, the, again, the Hello World uh, is the first app you're usually gonna run. So I'm just gonna Google Hello World Elixir. I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna stick it in here. Now, I'm just, I just wanna see before I explain anything to you, I've never used this tool, so I'm trying to figure out how it deals with compiled languages. Maybe I shouldn't use a compiled language that I don't know anything about to try to explain this to you. But, uh, saving, run project, I guess it's gonna compile for me. Okay, okay. This will not explain some of the topics that I want to explain, but this is good. I think you should, I think anyone who wants to follow along tonight should go ahead and use this. I'm going to do most of the stuff in here. So if I can do a new REPL, let's start with Python. Um, some of the common uh, interpreted languages that we care about are that, that like are popular, super popular. Python's one, and maybe this is this might be a time when you may want to take some notes on some of these things to kind of write these down. Uh, because I've I've been I've actually been in interviews when someone has asked me like, hey, like, do, do you prefer interpreted languages or uh, um, or compiled languages? Um, or, you know, are, is your preference static, static typing or dynamic typing? Um, and then I've heard people just like, ask me what like, hey, well, what dynamic languages have you used before? Like, are you familiar with? Um, and I think that's an interesting way to start a conversation. I think it's I think it makes you sound even smarter if you were to go into uh, an interview and you know, they're looking for information from you and you can say, uh, very confidently, like, even if you don't know all the languages, obviously, but you can say, Hey, I, you know, from the things that I've been learning, I'm really starting to like interpreted languages, you know, like Python or JavaScript rather than, you know, something like, I probably won't say Elixir, but like C sharp or go or Java. And it might make you sound really, really smart. Right. Uh, but yeah, right tool for the job. I, yes. Uh, B bytes back. That's a good name. Right tool for the job is uh, is important. Uh, each language has its own uh, benefits, pluses and minus things that it's good at. So let's talk about Python first. And one of the reasons why we're using Python. Python is a, an excellent general purpose language, um, and it's it's one of the most popular languages in the world, if not the most popular language in the world. Um, Python language rankings. It may have been first on at least the GitHub one. Look at that. Python's up here, number one. Uh, it's a pretty dope language. Like I said, it's general purpose. Uh, it's good at a lot of things. One thing that it's really good at is data science. Uh, so you probably heard this before. Data science and machine learning, it's very good at these things. Why is it very good at these things? It's not necessarily because inherently Python is better at these things. Um, due to its ease of use, uh, due to its general usability, uh, that is the direction that people took when they were building out the packages and the frameworks and the tools that were waiting on Python. Um, and so like all of the, not all of them, but many of the great uh, Python machine learning and data science tools uh, are written in Python. And so, you know, that's that's people's go-to for, uh, for that. So again, great scripting language as well. Uh, Python has a number of frameworks for web development as well. So if you want to develop things on the web, uh, Python is good for that as well. Uh, it has a framework called uh, uh, Flask, no, not Flask, uh, Django, sorry. Django is the web framework uh, for Python with Flask as well uh, to be able to build web apps uh, too. 
Um, so just a really good general purpose language that has a really nice readable syntax. So we talked about interpreted languages being slower than compiled languages uh, or less efficient. Let's say, let's say less efficient. Um, so uh, the readability is a little bit easier. So again, you saw hello world, the hello world.py program that we wrote. Um, you saw like, again, even if I wanted to print out something like, um, you do something like this. So uh, what you're seeing me do here are setting up some variables. Um, variables are just a placeholder uh, for a value. So they're, they're a little container that can hold the value and that value can be changed. We're gonna learn about that next time, but I'm giving it to you now. So let's say in my program, my name was Aaron uh, and my age uh, was, I'm not 22, I am 30. Um, and my height, I am, uh, and we'll make that a string as well. Uh, since I don't know my height, actually, no, we'll make it a number um, because everyone is in the US and uh, the imperial system is actually pretty stupid and the decimal system is better. Um, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, yes, no, the, what's the other system? Imperial is the US, the, uh, what's it called? I am, I'm hate metric. Oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. All right, metric system, metric system. I know metric, um, but yeah, it's base 10 though. I do know that. Um, the metric system. So we're gonna convert my height, uh, feet and inches. You guys like to see how I Google, this is how I Google everything, to centimeters. Do a little conversion tonight. I am, uh, uh, see how's it gonna let me enter this? Is it gonna, is it gonna let me do that? I don't think it did that. It just did the five feet. Uh, five foot eight is more like five foot, like five point. There's 12, so maybe more like, uh, whatever. We'll do like 174 centimeters because again, math, you know, and not my strong suit. It's okay. It's completely fine. You gotta worry about that right now. Not important. Five A's around 170. Well, I'm gonna be 174 centimeters today because I like to exaggerate my height so that people think I'm taller. So boom, 174. Okay. What we just did here, um, what we just did here is we set up three values. So um, we set up a value of name, which is set equal to my name, is, which is Aaron. And this thing can change. Uh, my age is 30, my height is 174. So now what we can do is we can use these placeholders uh, in place of these values. So if I wanna say, if I wanted to, you know, um, if I wanted to uh, say hello, uh, if I wanted to say print, Hello, my name is, I could put, hello, my name is Aaron. I could absolutely do that. And this will print and it will say, hello, my name is Aaron. These placeholders don't do anything. By default, they do nothing. They're just placeholders for data. But I could also do this. Instead of saying, hello, my name is Aaron. Excuse me, I could say, hello, my name is name. So I can say name and it will replace this value with the value that is set to up here. And again, we got the exact same output. There are a number of other ways to do that. Uh, what is what are some other string concatenation techniques in Python? Can I do this? Maybe I don't know. There's a number of ways to do it. It's Python three. Yes, it is. It's Python three. So this works as well. But it just gets this name gets replaced with this. So I can say my name is Aaron, and I am uh, age years old and I am height tall. Not important right now that you're understanding what I'm doing. Um, I want you to, uh, well, I want you to understand that I'm making a sentence right now. I'm, make, I'm simply making a sentence to say my name my age and my height. And we're gonna do this in other languages as well. I want you to see the syntactic differences. I want you to see the structural differences, but I also want you to, to really focus on their similarities. And, and, and I'm really gonna point out where we're doing the exact same thing across these languages. Um, and I am this many centimeters tall. Uh, this gotta go. Okay, so we're gonna run this. 
and it says hello my name is aaron i am 30 years old and i am 174 centimeters tall again i'm super tall you know the tallest person in the world is what i am uh the f is in the front uh for um in python 3 there's something called uh this is just the way that you format strings um that you can format your print statements um there are other ways to do it should we memorize the code to do this no you should not be memorizing the code to do this what i want you to see right now is that all i want you to see is that i set a value of name i set a value of age i set a value of height and i used all that information to print out a sentence we're going to do the same exact thing in a couple different languages right now so yes it's called string interpolation i didn't want to i didn't want to throw too many words at you uh but yes uh whoever asked about what the f is it is for string interpolation it is uh, a way for you to uh, add strings together. I might as well give it to you now. The word interpolation, you can go look it up, but what it, what it is is the act of combining strings together end to end. So taking, you know, one string, which is we learn that strings are uh, a collection of, of characters, basically, so think words and sentences and phrases, and it is combining them together end to end. So taking one string and putting it uh, and connecting it to another string. That is all a string uh, that's, that's what string interpolation is. No need to define string or integer. Correct, Goku Drift. So I do want you to notice here that uh, we talked about static types and strict type, strictly typed languages versus interpreted languages. Um, and you can see here that, uh, what data types are these? We, we haven't, do like, it's not important if you, like, don't feel bad if you don't know this. We, we very lightly touched on these things, but see the quotes here. Remember what I said when you should see when you see quotes, I want you to think string. So this right here is in fact a string. That is the type of data that it is. Um, that's the type of that's the type of data that it is. Age 30. Notice this does not have sh strings around it. I mean, it does not have quotes around it because it ha doesn't have quotes. It is uh, an integer. It is a whole number, which are different from decimals. We learned that they're different, different from decimals. And we'll be covering all of this in, very in depth uh, later. So Again, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you touch and see some of this stuff uh, without giving it all to you. Height, I have my height also as a number instead. Um, and then I'm using this information to create a sentence out of them. Um, so I could, I could just like, this sentence would be exactly the same if I instead made this Aaron. If I made Aaron in here instead, uh, this sentence would be the same thing. It would still print out just fine. Um, well, it wouldn't need to be in quotes. It would just be like this and it will print out just fine. But again, variables are a common concept. We'll talk about what you need them for, why you need them, um, as well. But let's go ahead and do the same thing in another, in another language. Let's set some variables. Let's make some, let's set some values. Um, you know, let's set name equal to something. Let's set age equal to something. Let's set height equal to something. Uh, and let's go ahead and see if we can construct the same type of string. Uh, so what was this? This was name. Would it print out the same without the F in the beginning? No, it would not. Uh, without the F in the beginning, actually, great. This is a great thing. Let's try this out. Without the F, we print it out. Look at this. It prints out name, age, and height. It prints out these things because that F at the beginning uh, instructed the computer to uh, interpret that data in a different way. Uh, so right now it's interpreting this data at, as is. So anything I put in here, it will do. But when I do this F here, this F um, tells it to format uh, my data accordingly. So uh, this is a paradigm that exists within Python. It's a newer thing in Python. Another way to do it would be like this. Uh, how you saw me do it before, um, but it's, you can see how this is much uh, sloppier um, like it's a little more confusing. I'll do another thing here. And I am plus. So you can also interpolate these strings by simply adding them together. So you can actually add strings together. Uh, so like over here, I can do, uh, hello plus goodbye in Python. And when you add strings together, it will interpolate them. So it sticks them together end to end. So it's hello, goodbye without a space uh, in between them. And so that's what's essentially happening right here. I'm taking things and I'm, I'm just adding them together. So age and same thing over here for height. 
and you can see how like gross this is like even if you don't know what i'm doing you're like mm, that's a lot of stuff that i don't know if i want to do and there's pluses and there's all kinds of quotes and it gets a little bit confusing and if i print this actually i messed it up where did i mess it up i messed it up at years old oh can i take off the f Looking at the, oh i have to yes ignore this uh well don't ignore this it's not letting me do this because these uh, are not strings so that's a that's a good that's a good topic to cover um i said interpolation is the act of adding strings together into end so it's adding words and phrases together into end age and height they are not strings they are, we just said they're integers, they're not strings. So what's happening here is it's letting us know. I, I can't concatenate this string because uh, I cannot concatenate an integer. Um, so we can do one of two things. We can change this, both of these to be strings. So now if these are strings, I could probably add strings, all the strings together. I hit play and I run it and it actually goes through and it adds all the strings together, but I can also do something cool called typecasting and type coercion. We're diving into a lot that I didn't want to dive into, but it's fine. We'll just have fun with it. We will have fun with it. We will go over all this stuff again, um, uh, very isolated and more in depth uh, for all this stuff, but cool. We have to tell this computer that, hey, I still want you to add these things together. So go ahead and try to turn this thing into a string. And this is called typecasting or type coercion. You are coercing this thing into a new type. You are casting it to a new type. And then if I hit play, it will still work because now, even though these are numbers, it's gonna try to make it into a string, but that's not important right now. I should just control Z this all the way back to how it was if I can, because it'll be the cleanest. And I, we, we really wanna compare this to other languages right now. So uh, we just explored Python a little bit and we're gonna do more with Python tonight. I'll see if this runs, yes. So. What do we say about Python? Again, interpreted, uh, dynamically typed language. The types are dynamic. It will do its best to uh, infer what kind of type you're using. Um, it is good, it's super popular. The, you know, it looks like it's the most popular language in the world right now, at least uh, from the Googling that we did. Um, it's a great general purpose language for a, a, you know, a lot of things. It's really good for scripting, really good for automation. Uh, you can build web applications with it as well using a uh, framework called Django and Flask. Um, and it's also really hot in the data science machine learning world. Um, so that's, that's one language. This is the one, this is one of the main ones we're gonna be using. So take a look at that, see what this looks like. Now, um, if I create a new REPL, can I get back to my other ones? Um, I'm gonna just go and control plus it. Let's, I'm just gonna go back to it because I'm scared of what it might do to me. We'll leave that up, we'll start coding. Let's take a look at the same kind of thing that we just did. Um, well, let's try to do it in Node.js, another language that we're gonna be using. Now, what is Node.js? Node.js is not a programming language, and I wanna be clear about that. Um, I know it might be confusing to a lot of people, but it is not. Uh, JavaScript is the programming language, and you'll sound, so normally it's fine to refer to them interchangeably, uh, but again, I'm trying to give you little tidbits that uh, you can use to make, uh, you know, to, to have some talking points in an interview and to really start breaking some of this stuff down. Node.js is, uh, it's JavaScript. So JavaScript is the language of the web. Uh, it is, it has no relation to Java, uh, but JavaScript is the language of the web. Um, and it's, it's the programming language that runs inside of your web browser. Um, Node.js is something that JavaScript used to only be able to run things on the front end of a website. So what you can see right here, it would, it's great to make your pages interactive. Uh, it's, it's a thing that allows your pages to be interactive and do cool things. Um, and you used to only be able to use that here on the front end. Uh, and you would have to use another language like Python uh, to do things on the back end. So if you wanted to like crunch some data and things like that and send data around, uh, you used to have to use a different language on the back end. That can make things pretty complicated. Uh, why that's that is the reason that is the main reason why there are front end and back end developers because the technologies used to be completely separate. 
you used to someone used to have to know Ruby, someone used to have to know JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and they will work on their associated things. Now, full the full stack programming is all the rage. Full stack web developers is, is, you know, is what people are hiring for. The reason why full stack is the term full stack is a thing. And the reason why uh, it's such a big thing is because of the creation of Node.js. Node.js takes JavaScript, which runs in the web browser. Um, and you, your, your web browser runs the JavaScript engine and it takes it and it turns it into a runtime that can run on the server. So this is server side JavaScript. It is a it is a server side implementation of the same JavaScript that you use to write things on the front end. So, um, so yeah, so Node is not a language. I've heard a lot of people, you know, the, a lot of people will tell you, hey, I know Node. Uh, no, you know JavaScript, you don't really know Node. Um, but yes, it is on this, it is not running here uh, in your browser. It is running, it's doing um, things on the server or whatever is the representation of the server. But um, yes, uh, it's again, a good talking point. It's, it's, it's just a great talking point. It's, it's a good thing to dive into. If you're like, yo, I know you just said these things, but like, I don't know what they meant. I, I want you to dive a little deeper into it. I'm like, go look up why JavaScript uh, is what runs in your web browser, not anything else. Um, go check out, you know, um, what it means to uh, you know, be a, a server side language or running on a server. What does that mean? These are these are concepts that we will dive into, but it will help if you dive into them first. And again, before you know it, things will start to click. But this is an implementation implementation of JavaScript. So, um, simply you you simply write JavaScript here. Uh, it's also worth noting that you can actually write JavaScript right in your web browser. It is. Um, you can write JavaScript right here in your web browser. I, all I did was right click the page and went to inspect. I'm in Google Chrome uh, and you can actually write JavaScript right here and it will interpret it for you. Why? Again, because it has your browser uh, has a, a JavaScript engine inside of it. So to say hello to everyone, again, you saw me do console.log a number of times. I could type it down here and it's probably hard to see, but if I type in, hello, my name is Aaron. And I hit enter, it prints that out and I can actually write whatever JavaScript I want in here. The same JavaScript that I could write on node over here uh, or, or in the node runtime over here, it may not be able to do the same functionality um, just due to where it's running, but it is, uh, it is, you know, it's where you can write JavaScript. So let's do the same thing that we did over here in another, uh, another interpreted language. So JavaScript is an interpreted language. It is dynamically typed. It is, as far as languages that I've used, uh, it is the most relaxed language. Uh, it allows you to do the most, which is good and bad. Uh, it allows you to get things up and running quickly, uh, but can also cause you a lot of problems. It gives you the most freedom kind of to make mistakes, which again, can be both good and bad. Um, to be totally frank, I don't understand the idea of server side. Perfect, that, that's fine. Um, just know that the things that uh, you're looking at when you're on your web browser. Um, this is something called the client. Uh, so the client uh, is interpreting a certain amount of data, but all the processing and things of a website um, generally aren't going to be done on your web browser uh, because again, that would be super heavy when you need to get data and stuff from a site. When you go to uh, Facebook, for example, a lot of things, the things that you see are kind of being, uh, you know, processed by your web browser to show you those things. But when you need to search, uh, we need to search all the people, all your friends, and you want to see, you know, what's Marvin doing? Like, how is it Marvin's birthday? When you, you know, type it in and you hit enter, uh, the front end, uh, the client does a certain amount of things, but then it ships off information to the back end, to server, to the server side. So there's a computer that's sitting off uh, in Facebook's data centers uh, that's going to do the processing of your data. And it does that processing. It goes and gets the information that you want. Uh, and it sends that data back to your client. So uh, that's where a lot of the processing happens. The server side is simply a, another computer in which processing happens on um, for the processing that you don't see. So again, when people talk about front end and back end, the back end is server side. The, the, the back end things are usually server side. Again, I know nowadays with the way the technologies have uh, changed, uh, the the water is muddy um, and those have, but you know, very high level, that's kind of what, where we mean when we say, you know, front end and back end or a server side, 
versus client side. Um, yes, Java, yes, JavaScript is actually uh, ECMAScript. Um, that was a very interesting thing when uh, I watched the course. I was like, Ugh, "What is uh, what is?" Cause I, I didn't know what. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, talk about ES. ES six is what we're up to now. Um, ECMAScript six is. JavaScript, it was created to standardize JavaScript to help foster multiple independent implementations. So yeah, it's based off of ECMAScript 6. Um, there are other versions of ECMAScript that change. Um, but yeah, I don't know if ES7 is out. I don't really keep up with JavaScript that much. Oh, look at this. ECMAScript 2016 ES7, look at that, we're fancy. So maybe we are up to ES7 and not 6, I don't know. I don't know what the differences are between them because I'm not a JavaScript developer, but I do do stuff with the JavaScript, but Again, a web language, it is the web language, uh, but it's also good for, because you can now do it on the server side. Um, uh, it's also people use it for automation, uh, kind of just like Python. Um, people use it, uh, again, it's mostly, it's mostly used on the web because it's required there. Uh, you cannot have a website, an interactive web, and you can have an interactive website without JavaScript, uh, even if you're using another language to do the stuff you still need to have JavaScript uh, on the front end at least. Um, yeah, and it's again, mainly used for, it's used for scripting and automation as well, um, but it's very popular, lots of jobs in it. But let's do the same thing that we did over here. In here, what's up, uh, Oakley Ham? Welcome to the channel, thank you for the follow. It is good to have you tonight. Well, let's see what it looks like when we do it in JavaScript. So we're gonna set up three variables. So we're gonna set up three containers that contain a value, name, age, and height. Let's do that over here. So name. Uh, equals so if I, actually here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna copy and paste This here so you can kind of see it real time uh, We're gonna comment all of it out. So you don't know what comments are yet, but um, comments are a way to uh, tell The interpreter so remember the interpreter is interpreting our code line by line a comment is a way for you to one document things inside of your code, but it the comment tells your interpreter to skip this line. Hey, do not read this line. Uh, I want you to, to not interpret this line as code. Uh, just go ahead and move past it. This allows you again to put some notes in your code. So if I want to say like, this is an app that tells my name, age and height or whatever. I could put a little note in there for anyone if I needed to, uh, to get to document my code, to comment the code. But let's take this and let's turn it into JavaScript. So JavaScript uh, also has variables. All languages are gonna have variables. And the way that you do one here is actually uh, to name a variable, I have to say let name equals Aaron. Whereas I don't have to do that in Python. Seems pretty, seems, you know, interesting. Uh, JavaScript you used to have to put these little semicolons at the end of every line as well. Uh, you do not have to do that anymore. Um, but let's do the same thing. So let age equals 30 let what's the last thing height equals 174 centimeters because i'm the tallest man in the planet now what did, essentially let's think about what we did uh what we like let's think about the, the things that we actually did in the last little bit of code we set three variables and then we we displayed text we concatenated some strings. Uh, we interpolated some strings to display text. That's all we essentially did. We didn't do anything fancy. Uh, the act of what we we're doing is we were displaying text to the screen. This print command, it sent data from here onto the screen over to the right over here. So we wanna do the same things in JavaScript. That is the act that we we're doing. We we're displaying output. So um, we can do console. Yeah, um, CSS comments like that. I could have block commented this as well, but um, I've gotten so used to my uh, Vim commands and my Vim shortcuts and they're doing stuff for me that uh, I don't remember how to do them. Uh, Console.log is how you do it in JavaScript. You just saw me do it and we can do it the same way. Um, we can do it a very similar way. Uh, so we can say, hello, my name is, and I can do the same thing, um, name. Actually, there's, a number, there's, there's easy ways. Let's do it the cleaner way here as well. Um, I think JavaScript, what can you do? Dollar sign. I think I can do it this way. Let's find out real quick before I type it all out. 
name um okay it's not dollar sign if it's not dollar sign what is it uh, javascript i don't want to interpolate with pluses javascript um string interpolation let's see i don't want to i could do a template literal i don't want to do that i want i know you could i thought you could do it with dollar sign and squiggly oh it's a, it's a literal with okay got it so it's back ticks um that's whack okay um so i almost had it right and this is like the like you as we get farther you'll be like oh like this is the simple stuff and look at him he doesn't know how to do the simple stuff and it's like yeah like you forget how to do like when you deal with a lot of different languages you'll forget these things and that's gonna be the fun of this course is that like you're gonna start to understand what we're actually doing rather than trying to learn a specific language right now our goal is to uh interpolate these strings um and to concatenate these strings to make a sentence uh these variables with these variables so my name is name and i am dollar sign age and i am dollar sign height centimeters tall all right so this is okay so this actually looks very similar uh you know the the the, the thing that we're using to print it out is a little bit differently is a little bit different but like they're similar like yeah we have the dollar sign here and we don't have the regular quotes but for the most part it's like very similar and this didn't work let's see template literal height is undefined i spelled height wrong let's run it all right and so it printed out exactly how we wanted it so look at these two implementations i wonder if i can actually can i do this does it work with like yeah oh almost all right so look at these two implementations this is python down here and this is javascript up here pretty 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 close to each other right so Again, spending a lot of time, this like, this is the exact reason why I don't want you to spend a lot of time focusing on the syntax of the languages and things like that. Uh, look how similar these things are. Um, and this is why as you get deeper into your programming career, um, you won't care so much that you don't know when you apply for a job, you they, and they won't care as much that you don't know uh, this language, you don't know Java, you don't know oh, very well, or you don't know, you know Python very well, but you know these other languages, you come from Ruby, uh, you come from JavaScript and you want to learn, you want to take a Python job or something, you can do that. You can do that because the concepts are what are important. Um, and yes, the syntax is important, but you can Google the syntax. If you understand the concepts, you can figure those things out. Your text editor will do a lot for you as well. Um, but just again, look how, you know, uh, how simple this is. We could do something like Ruby as well, um, which, you know, I used to write a lot of Ruby and I don't, I haven't written Ruby in years and it will look similar to this as well. But let's let's try some compiled languages. We did that's an interpreter language. Let's try some uh try some compiled languages. Does anyone have any questions right now? I you guys have been having a lot of chats here and uh and I have I've been ignoring them. I'm sorry. Yeah, I haven't looked at uh ES2020 yet. No idea if it's worth learning, but probably. So Node is like a local server or it creates a local server so you can run JS. <laughs> um yeah. So, uh, your web browser ships with a JavaScript engine. Uh, it, it ships with the runtime that can interpret the data, just like you download a Python on your computer. Uh, your your web browser actually comes with that same type of interpreter for JavaScript. Node is uh, a, a, is that runtime uh, convert? It's that engine. It's been converted um, into a way for it to run on a system. Uh, you can start a local, you can use Node to start a local server. Uh, it is not a local server um, by default. It is just, it is just a, uh, a program that will interpret JavaScript. It just, that's all it does. It runs locally instead of in the web browser and it will interpret JavaScript code for you uh, so that, you know, you can make it do what it wants to do. Uh, but it is not, uh, it does not make a local server, but you can, Start. A, you can use it to make a local server, but by it, just Node itself is not a local server. 
remember to comment for your for your future self yes those comments we talked about like when you're doing programs like make a comment you it's when you go back to look at your code it's really hard to remember why you were doing something um and comments really really help um it was like whoever made the let comment command thought they were good that they were god let there be light yeah i, I the, the let is interesting uh so for javascript you can also do uh what's up lols 010 i think someone else just followed welcome to the channel thank you i should just click my activity feed which i can see that oh i didn't log in but i can click it up here um but uh you can also do it with um let is relatively new to javascript var works as well uh in javascript now nah, again not crazy important um right now uh, i would use let if you're learning javascript uh that's a newer paradigm uh and there are a number of there's a few small differences between them but uh yeah let is how you do that um but yeah let's try uh let's let's do go now since these are two of the languages that we're going to be doing Let's go ahead and take both of these. Let's make a new one. Let's go with go. Bear Ripple. Now this is gonna look very different. And you can see here, the first two that we did never even gave us uh, any code. It gave us a blank page and now we have some stuff here. I'm oh, sorry, I thought I was at the bottom, but I was nowhere near the bottom. Sorry. I could show you const, I'm not showing you const right now. I thought it was a language and I've worked with Node, my own Node, and that's fair. It's it's completely fair that like, it's completely fair that you think it's a language. Most, most people think it's a language, uh, think it's the language, but it's just JavaScript. Just close an issue from October feels good. That's a long time, but that's dope. My dollar sign doesn't turn black. Uh, that, oh darn it, I'm missing all these. Back to the JavaScript, let's paste this below. This is, I think mine didn't either. Uh, I'm gonna, what's the, I don't know what a block comment is. Actually it did, hold on, it worked before when I did the block comment here, which is nice. Uh, so for anyone working with a text editor or something, commonly, the uh you're gonna you're gonna get real comfortable with um with keyboard shortcuts the way that you do block comments if you want to comment multiple lines at once uh you hold control and you do slash and it will do all of them for you uh, again for most text editors this is the common thing you type in vs code which i told most of you to use that'll do it um that will do it how do i run code in vs code i don't see the green symbol anymore if you hit save you should see it um, you should see the green symbol. If not, you'll have to run it via the command line. Um, hopefully, as I scroll, you've got that. Uh, you've got that running. I'm running Python right now. However, CS50. It's fun, but some of the exercises are really hard. So yes, um, we will. We will definitely take it um, a lot better. I, I I'm always flabbergasted by those classes and the first like exercises they give you. They're such like extravagant exercises for what they just taught you. Like every single time. I was like, man, like this is this is not equivalent to what you just taught me. When you see package, is that the sign that it's a compiled language? Um oh probably. Um prob oh, in in here probably. That that would make possibly. Is go object oriented? Um no, Go is not, uh, it's not object oriented, um, but you can use, you can use it. Um, it has a, it has a paradigm called structs, um, or structure stru for structures, I believe. Um, and you can use that to operate in a, um, an object oriented like manner. Um, but it is not an object oriented language. It's kind of, it's not, yeah, it's not really object oriented though. All right, so real quick, let's go through, let's do the same thing. Well, look how it already gave us some code. So uh, a compiled language automatically needs some type of code to run. Like I bet if I go back to this one, and I go to new REPL and I do it in something like, I don't know C++, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it up in C++. I bet it'll give me some code as well. I bet it'll give me, it'll give me some starter code. Why? Uh, give me some starter code because 
uh, it's a com it's a compiled language and it needs uh, there's a certain structure that it needs to be able to run so it gives it to you it gives that to you out of the box whoa the follow train going what's up everyone who just followed disclosure actually let me pull this up so i can see the list of things that have happened so that i'm actually saying hello make this a little bit smaller let's scroll to the bottom here nope that's too that's from months ago it is to the top what's up uh adam barker live what's up remissio 94 what's up reme poene that is i didn't say that right at all but how are you doing tonight uh disclosure i think i gave it to you as well lols 010 simpi simpi boto welcome sarah welcome squirrel noises and then i think i gave uh oakleyham i castillo welcome to the channel thank you everyone for following uh, 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 mm. Gotta catch up with an old friend. I have to catch this vibe. Yeah, all good. All good. Um, like I said, we'll be up um tomorrow, next day. Okay, so let's go back to the go one. Um, and so let's see how different this is. And again, this is why generally uh statically typed languages can be tough for people. Let's do the same thing that we just did. So I'm actually gonna delete this code. And the way that we do what we just did um, for the other things is we now we need to make some variables. So how do we make some variables in Go? Um, so you can do uh, you can do it in a, in a number of different ways. There's actually like three different ways to make variables. Uh, one of the ways is I could say like var uh, name equals a uh, var name, and then I can give it a value later. Um, but um, all right, and I can give it. I have to. I would have to give it a type. So I would have to do something like var name um uh and i would say it's a string and then below i would give like name equals aaron this is a way to do it this is one way to do it uh there's some shorthand for it um go is a weird language uh, a weird compiled uh statically typed language because what i can do is i can do name and i can do this sweet shorthand right here and i can type in string i mean not string i can type in aaron now, usually, normally, normally we have to tell statically typed language what type something is. Uh, and we say that statically typed languages do not have any type inferencing, but Go does have a bit of type inferencing. It does its best and it says, hey, you got quotes around that bad boy. That's a string to me. I'm smart enough to know that. So it does have some type inferencing. So we're just gonna do the same thing. We're gonna do age equals 30. So this is how you do it again in go. This is one of the ways to do it in go. Height equals 30. All right, so I got three things here and now you can already see that I have a bunch of squiggly lines here. Um, And actually, do we still have one of the other ones up? Check out this one right here. Look, what, look at what happens if I remove, let's say height. If I run this right now, I am not using the height variable, but I can still run this and it will still work. It's still all good, completely fine here, even though I'm not using height. Go on the other hand, um, it's showing these squiggly lines because I'm not using these and compiled languages generally will not allow you to have code that's available that you aren't using. Um, especially variables. Why won't that won't that happen? It's because it does all the pre compilation up front. It does it compiles up front, and it has to allocate space for these things. So it doesn't want to allocate um, any memory or RAM or anything to, for these things. It doesn't want to allocate any bits and bytes uh, for these things because they're not being used. So it says, "Hey, I'm not even gonna, like you have a problem here. You need to you declared it, but you didn't use it. You need to clean it up or use it somewhere." Um, so just something I wanted to give to you. So the way that we print out to the screen, the way that we do that is we actually use a uh, format, a package called format, which we have already have imported up here. And um, you can do print line. We're gonna do something called printf. And we're gonna do, um, hello, my name is uh what is it i think it's uh let's go percent v uh and i am percent v and i am 
percent V. Um, centimeters tall. Over here, I'm gonna put name. And see how, as soon as I type in name, see how this goes away? Cause it knows that I'm using this thing now. Name, age, height. Okay, this looks different. Uh, this looks close, but it looks different from some of the other stuff. Let's run it and see if it runs. It's building, took a little bit, but my name is Aaron and I'm 30 and I am 30 centimeters tall. Let's add the years old here and I am V years old. And I am, okay, run this, make sure it still runs. All right, so now we have three different programs. Um, we have three different programs that uh, this one is like 11 lines of code. The first one was five lines of code. And I think the second one was around five lines of code. So this is a bit different in that, uh, what I did here, um, actually, I think I could have done an S, a D, and a D is the thing of what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's, this is what it's supposed to be, S, D, and D. Um, but you can see here, even with this language that is a little more verbose, uh, you can see here that it's still pretty similar. We still declared variables. Now, again, the syntax is different, but we're still declaring some variables. Uh, we still declared, you know, our name, our age, our height. And actually, you know, if I put my cursor over this, I, th I thought it would tell me the type. It did not. Um, but we're still able to do that properly. Um, and then we were still able to concatenate uh, and interpolate the string that we wanted to create. We did it in a completely different way. This is way different from what you saw from down here. Um, these are not included in the, um, you know, in the, in the string at all. Uh, they're included after the string. Uh, Go has a print F string. So remember that F that we use in Python. This is a formatting. Uh, this is a formatting verb. Uh, so it allows you to format strings. And what it allowed us to do is give some placeholders. So this percent S, the percent D, and the percent D are placeholders. And then we tell it what to replace those placeholders with down here. And it does them in order. So if I switch it out, if I if I don't do it in order, if I do age first. When it gets to the first one, it's going to grab the first one. So if I do age first, this is actually going to break. Uh, it will work if I had the V's in place, but this is going to break. Uh, and why did it break? It, it, well, it didn't break, but look at that. That looks super weird. Um, it didn't it didn't like that because uh, these these identifiers here uh, are, are, are you telling go what type these things are so they can work properly. Uh, and S is for string D is for digit, I believe. Um, and so to have them switched, it causes some problems. Um, the V does its best to just interpret what the type is best, but, um, we'll leave it as is, um, and we'll just fix these again. So again, three different ways to do the same thing. Name, age and height. All right, but you can see here how all this code looks similar. Like if I uncomment all this stuff, um, it looks similar. This is the, what is this? This is the JavaScript. Man, I cannot type. And down here is the Python. And let's try a language that I don't know. Again, like C, so it's one of the C languages or something. Um, but they look they look very similar. They're not they're not wildly different. And we're doing the same concepts. We're setting up some values, and then again creating a string and interpolating those values into the string. Um, syntax is different. The concept between them becomes a little bit different when you get to the compiled language. But ultimately, the code looks very similar. So. It's not that crazy. Now let's try another one. I don't know C sharp. And so maybe this is a good opportunity for you to see how I would go uh, learn a new language. So if I already know what I need to do. Um, so now if I'm like, hey, I don't know how to create a variable in C sharp. So I can Google, how do you create a variable in C sharp? And I can look at it. And because I know how to do it in one, and because I understand the concept of a variable, I can use that uh, in C sharp. If I like, and then I can say, how do I, interpolate strings. How do I concatenate strings in C sharp? And I can go find that information. So let's try this. Let's see if we can get it working. Uh, so that was go. 
and let's duplicate it and try a new one. Do they have C sharp on here? They have C plus plus. Oh, when I click the thing to go down, it doesn't let me. So C plus plus is there. It's scrolling very slow, very, very slow scrolling. Was that C sharp? All right, I know nothing about it. Let's go. Okay. So the, the simple, so console.writeline seems like the way that you can just uh, print something out because they gave us, they gave all the apps give us a hello world. So this is how we're gonna be able to print something out. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, hello, my name is Aaron and I am 30 years, oh my gosh, years old and I am 100, 274 centimeters tall. Yeah, now I really am the tallest person. All right, so I can, so I know what strings are. So I'm, I'm thinking this is gonna work. I, I was able to print hello world. So maybe this will print out what I want. And maybe I'll press play. And it looks like it did what I wanted to do. So not knowing C sharp, I, you know, I was able to take console that right line and print out our statement. Now let's see if we can do variables. So let's Google uh, variables in C sharp. Uh, oh, they have W3 schools. That's nice. Uh, so variables in C sharp looks like I have to give it a type, the variable name and a value. So uh, here's an example string name equals John. Perfect. So I take that. And with that information, I think that I have everything that I need. And I'm assuming it has to go with inside the public statement. Um, I hope, um, maybe not. We could try some other places as well. So string, uh, name equals, I wonder if I have to put it in, I'm assuming I have to do this. And I think I have to do int. Is that a, is that a type here? It, it auto completed string for me. Let's see what the options are. I'm assuming it has to be an integer. Um, oh, uh, maybe, I, maybe I need the, mm, okay. I, I, maybe I have to close this first. Oh, look, okay. looks like you told me that. Yeah. Uh, let's close it first. Mm, I don't like semicolon languages. So good thing to know, go actually does have semicolons. Uh, you do not write them. It's not a part of your source code. What's the source code, the code, the human readable code that you write, but it does in fact, um, it, it does put semicolons in uh, when it is compiling. Uh, so they are a thing. Uh, so maybe if I type in int now. <laughs> Only reason it might be, I'm assuming it's int, but it's not uh, completing for me. So let's see what types we have. Oh, it's, it's int. So let's go int uh, age equals 30. Wow, good higher semicolon and int. Right, equals 274 centimeters because I'm so tall. Now, uh, I wonder if this will allow it to run. Uh, it's very interesting. So I'm not using any of these variables, but I wanna just explore and see how it works. And no, it is not gonna let me do that. Um, I can't see the full error, but I bet, um, oh wait, actually, I think that's because of this. Maybe it will. Hmm. So it prints this, but it also gives us a warning. Okay, that's nice. I, I, I kind of like that. Um, I like that it warns us, um, but still runs. It still compiles and runs. That's interesting. I think I like that. Um, so let's let's figure out how to interpolate strings. Um, maybe C sharp strings is what I want. And I'm not joking. I have no idea how to write C sharp. So we are doing this live, so you can kind of see how. And I'm and I'm not. I'm also not an expert programmer. Um, and I think running through this course in this way and touching all these languages will make it a lot easier for you to be able to do exactly what I'm doing now. Um, so it looks like I can do two plus. Is there a format like we did with the rest? Um, string concatenation into plus. But but if I do a plus, oh, here we go. Dollar sign to start it. Oh, so I can send it to another variable. Let's try this. Let's try this right here. So what they did here is they set up a whole new variable and they concatenated it 
using a dollar sign in these things and they printed it out. I wonder if I'm gonna be able to have to cast these or not. So let's go back to our code again. Um, and let's let's see if we can first do that this way. I, I, I wonder if we can just stick it in here. Maybe we can, maybe we cannot. Who knows? Well, someone out there knows. Let's see. Um, dollar sign and all it was is, okay, let's try that. So we did the name before we changed everything. I'll just try a name, see what happens. Whoa, whoa. Okay, that worked. We printed out, my name is Aaron, but still give us some some warnings, but it did print out Aaron. So let's have, let's see what happens when I do a number. So this is a number and not a string. I wonder how this will work in C sharp. I don't know. Not 30, uh, age. It did fine. It did fine. And I'm going to read those errors in a second to see if they matter. And what if I do? And what if I do height right here? I get no errors and it does everything properly. So this code looks very much like all of our other stuff. Again, even though there's all this other stuff that's needed by C sharp again. We did the same concepts. The concepts that we did were set up some values. Uh, we knew we needed to set up some values, some variables uh, that held some data. Um, and then we needed to take those, take that data and we needed to create a sentence out of them. And we needed to replace the variable items with the uh, with, with the actual value, the variable names, the actual value. And we were able to do that in a language that we don't know. Um, and you can see how all the code looks very similar. I'm gonna post this. I'm gonna take all these ones and post them in, uh, in Google Classroom. Let's do that now, actually. Here's what I'll do to make it easier. Um, I'm gonna open up a file really quick. I'm gonna open up a folder um, real fast. Documents. Decoded. Um, let's, um, yeah. let's MK their uh, examples, I guess, is what we're gonna want. Examples, CD into examples, um, Vim, uh, what is it? Uh, Example.go, um, one DG, let's copy all of them. So the go example is gonna be here. All right, so this is go. Um, vim example dot, what else do we do? JS, JavaScript. We'll do vim example dot py or Python. And the last one was C sharp. And I actually don't even know what C sharp's uh, file extension is. I think it's CS example.cs, I believe. And we can confirm by going to uh, here.cs. Yes. That's CS. So we'll copy this. And there we go. So we have all of our examples in this folder. Uh, I'm going to post this folder into the class. Let me do that now. Can I just put a folder in there? Um, what is this in documents decoded? <laughs> Let's do it real time to make sure you actually get it. Cause I'll forget to do it later. To my spinary, um, create material. Um, add file. Let's drag these bad boys over. Oh, so look at that. My, my computer gave it all nice little extensions. 
There we go. Upload. Let's put it underneath today. Um, our different language examples right here. We'll post it. Cool. Now you got it. Now you got it in there. Um, the different codes. So take a look at those again, compare them, take a look at the differences, like really, you know, uh, check out how we did them. Um, you know, really uh, dive into the, if you were super confused, it's okay. Look into the, like, just look at them. Just look at the code. Um, and, and you could run it if you had everything installed. I don't have C sharp installed, but you can install C sharp if you wanted. Um, maybe you have go installed. Um, maybe you have JS installed in Python, uh, but check, check those, like check those out if you need to. Um, but also just there in case you need some reference to kind of mess with some stuff. I would also highly recommend that you modify this. So like figure out how to put your name in there. Like, you know, uh, figure out how to like, you know, put your name in your age, like start with that. Um, so let's say we wanted to change the example.js. How do you think you could put your name in there? How do you think you could put your age in there? Uh, a mess around, see when you change things, see what happens when you change it, try to run it if you can. Um, if you're not sure how to run it, go ahead and Google like, hey, how do I, or just Google, how do I run JavaScript code? And maybe, uh, you maybe it'll just take you to REPL.IT or was that what it was, REPL it? Um, maybe you just need to paste it into REPL and try it there or like, it doesn't really matter. Um, it, you'll learn uh, through the process, you'll learn different ways to do things. You'll learn things that you like, which you don't like. Um, and I, again, I highly encourage you to explore. The goal of this was to just show you the, the kind of way some of these things worked. Uh, we talked about some of the benefits of the different languages. Um, did we talk about Go? We didn't, talk, we didn't talk about the benefits of Go or C Sharp. I don't know the benefits of C Sharp. We can look it up. But some of the benefits of Go and the reason why we're using it is Go is, uh, is a super fast language that was um, designed uh, for systems. So it was made out of Google. It was born out of Google. Uh, and it was made to, to really uh, solve their problems. So, you know, a company of Google scale uh, needs something that's very fast, very performant, um, and hopefully easy to write. Um, and so that was their goal out of out of Go. Uh, it's used for a lot of systems programming. It's used for to make a lot of tools. A lot of DevOps tools are written using Go. Uh, again, because of the speed and readability, um, and that's generally what people use it for. Yes, it does have web frameworks and stuff that aren't so popular though. Um, but people are starting to do more and more with it. There are actually a number of uh, of machine learning things that are also being written in Go because of how fast it is. Um, but again, it's just, it's never gonna have the ecosystem that Python has, I don't think. Um, but yeah, mostly for system stuff, uh, really good for automation and stuff as well, good for tools. Uh, and C-sharp, C-sharp is written by Microsoft. Uh, I don't know it for. Um, what is C-sharp good for? I don't know. What's up, uh, Russ Advocate, welcome to the channel. What's up, Kalim1? Uh, hey, Steffi, welcome to the channel. Kumo Quat Goat Beef, <laughs> excellent names. And then I got everyone else. What's up, I'm Medieval. Welcome to the channel. Its versatility, efficiency, and good performance make it an excellent choice for high complexity data manipulation software like databases or 3D animation. The fact that many programming languages today are better than C for their intended use doesn't mean that they beat C in all areas. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, that's, uh, that's for C, not C sharp. Maybe I actually have to type in C sharp. See, these are a little, these are a little, uh, Google ignore the, yeah, the sharp, uh, these are a little Googling tips you'll have to learn. Uh, one of the reasons why, if you're looking for how, how to do stuff in go, you don't type in go, you type in go lang, even though it's not called go lang, it's called go. Uh, you have to type in go lang to get the answers you want because the word go is super common everywhere. Almost everything it's used to build Windows desktop applications and games. I know it's super popular for games, desktop applications. Um, that's cool. Web applications become increasingly popular for mobile development too. All right, cool. It's, it looks like it's object oriented. Nice. That's, you know, now I know a little bit about C sharp and maybe I could go have a conversation about it. Um, but I'm also might dive deeper into, you know, deeper than that one day today is not that day. Um, I am interested in game development though. I, 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 I am very interested in game development. So maybe we'll do some stuff uh, with that. Um, object oriented 
uh, we'll, we'll, we'll also get there too. We'll talk about, um, uh, well, let me see. I don't think I ever gave you guys this, um, but it is a it is a programming paradigm where things are centered around something called objects. Um, and the way that you interact with things um, are around that, that, that concept of objects. Um, and again, it's until I go deep into it, it's gonna be confusing. But decoded apprentice. What are we talking about object oriented? We are talking about that here. We have a whole day for object oriented programming. You down with OP OOP? Uh OOP stands for object oriented programming. So that is where we talk about that. Uh that's what we're talking about that. <laughs> How is your chat quicker than ours? I watch you for life. Oh, I don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, you can reach out to DevOps with DevOps questions. Go ahead and ask away now. We have a little time. So any, any DevOps questions you have now ask, but uh, reach out. Uh, I'm going back up to, I'm going back up in the chat a little bit so that I can actually see what, uh, see what I did there? Uh, what you guys are asking. Only place you see them and go is for loops, correct? Oh, the semicolons, yeah. Also worth noting that Go only has four loops. Really, when we get to loops, it's gonna be exciting, but for anyone who knows how to program already, who doesn't know anything about Go, Go only has four loops, one type of loop, uh, which is great. You can use it a couple of different ways, but uh, it only has one type of loop. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can make a whole program application in C Sharp. Um, you can. My main language, um, that's a good question. That's a tough question to answer. Uh, so my most proficient language is absolutely Go. Um, Go is my most proficient language by far. Um, I, I spent a lot of time learning some pretty advanced topics in Go. Um, but as you can see, even those advanced topics uh, kept me from knowing how to do little things like convert, um, you know, um, those uh characters into those integers etc gotta look up things all the time but go um and then the next one honestly has become P python used to be my second um but i don't do anything professionally with python anymore um and i lately i've been the project i work on now is uh in javascript so i'm i'm getting surprisingly good at javascript i never thought i would say that never wanted to do that i'm not a web developer um but i do web development um and so I'm getting surprisingly good with JavaScript. Uh, I'm really good with Bash, really good with Bash, even though, you know, people don't consider that to be a language. Um, whatever, I'm really good with Bash, um, but Go for sure. Um, I'm gonna be diving into, I know a little bit of Ruby. Um, I'm gonna be diving into Rust really soon. Uh, I wanna get really good at Rust. Uh, and, and not necessarily really good at Rust. I wanna get really good at the lower level concepts that Rust uh, uh, makes you take into account but those are my, uh, Go is definitely my main language. Uh, if I, you know, if I was gonna just write something right now, if I was gonna do any type of automation, again, I do use the best tool for the job. I, so I would use, I would actually use Python uh, if I wanted to just put something together real quick, uh, just cause it's ease of running, ease of use. Um, but Go is, Go is my main language. Like if I was gonna build an application, I would do it in, in Go. Mm -hmm. Let's see, for beginner, you recommend learning Python over Go? Um, y y yes, yes. I, I do recommend learning Python over Go. Um, I actually recommend you learning them at the same time, to be honest. I know people don't usually recommend that. Um, if, you, if your goal is to understand like all the programming, like if you wanna become a good programmer, I would recommend you use, learn them both. One, because I, like I said earlier, Python will give you the instant gratification. Python will allow you to do stuff uh, that you just won't be able to do out of the box and go. Um, and that'll make you keep going. So I think go and I think statically type languages have the potential to stop you in your tracks. Uh, I think um, I think they teach you more, but I think there's a significant amount of, uh, of mental energy that uh, is important to keep going, to be able to get through those beginning humps and learning how to program. And I think Python, again, gives you that instant gratification. You can see things real fast. The setup is simple. Uh, it's super easy to do some dope things. Uh, whereas Go is not quite this, it's not quite the same, uh, but I would, so I would recommend Python before Go or at the same time.
Mm -hmm. We talked about object oriented a little bit. Yeah, Rust. I'm definitely diving into Rust. Uh, C++. I'm not, maybe, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Most game users. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me how is your chat quicker than oh, you already said. I don't know what that means um, at all. It comes down to speed of light. All right, I just graduated from college, CS degree. I feel like I don't know that much. No, you are not, I'm medieval. So someone actually uh, tweeted the other day um, that, that, you know, basically uh, they, you know, they had their CS degree and like, they didn't learn. They, they felt like they were. They felt super lost, um, kind of in the in the industry. The reason that is is because your CS degree, um, whoops, your CS degree uh, teaches you the again concepts and theory behind programming. It teaches you how to do how to do some problem solving, um, but it, it doesn't necessarily teach you the technologies um, and the uh, implementation kind of real real time real life. It does for some things, but uh, a lot of stuff, you'll, you never know what you're gonna be doing and tech changes so fast. Uh, that's fully expected, uh, but those concepts are applicable. Um, now you just have to figure out a way to add some context to those things. My current desktop support position and looking to get into DevOps, you should do it. I have enough money saved up in three months off. What should I look into? Also, if I create a few projects, that's dope. So one, uh, sorry to hear that you got laid off, uh, Soul Supreme 93, but um, the good thing is that uh, I'm glad you have some money saved up. Your help desk experience will absolutely uh, be relevant in the tech industry. Like I think having that experience on your resume helps. I think for everyone on here, anyone trying to get into the industry, the first, uh, like getting that first job on the resume is kind of, is like, that's the hardest part. Like once you kind of have a one job under your belt, people are willing to, you know, hire you after you kind of have that one thing on your resume. So the help desk stuff will help. And I think there are ways you can, no matter what you were doing at the help desk job, I think there are ways to um, word that and highlight that on your resume to really uh, help you get into more DevOps roles. Uh, I, I, if I were you for, for having three months, the place that I think you can get the fastest um, and the most uh, the bang for your buck would be to focus on the cloud. Uh, to be honest, get good, get decent at Linux and get good at the cloud. Um, and, and you can easily move into one of the systems administrator roles like cloud sysadmins, DevOps roles. They're all, they name the jobs all the same. They're the, they're all, they're named weird because no one really knows how to talk about this stuff. But um, I like, I think the best bang for your buck, buck right now uh, would be to dive into either AWS or Azure. Uh, really kind of learn it uh, get you know get decent with Linux and I think you'll I think you'll be in a good spot to get uh, those DevOps roles uh, more DevOps positions yeah solutions uh, solutions architect uh, associate that's dope and dev associate yeah um, the dev associate is weird um, it's yeah it's interesting but that's dope you should definitely grab those um, perfect um, welcome to <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to, I'll definitely be reaching out, uh, rest advocate. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super interested. Definitely something I'm super interested in. I, I was telling people in the DevOps bootcamp that I'm from a systems background. So like I started out as like a systems administrator, uh, dealt heavily with Linux and I worked out of data centers and stuff. Um, and over the past few years, like right now I, I lead an application team. Um, and so I write a lot more software nowadays. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not the greatest software uh, engineer at all, but I'm learning a lot more. And like, that is like become, I've become so much like super passionate about uh, tech. Like infrastructure is my jam. That's the stuff I know very well. Um, but I really am interested in software now. So like I've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, design principles and, and different software design um, learning and things like that to really understand how to uh, create, create cool software. Uh, and it, it's really intriguing to me. And I really want to dive deeper um, and spend some time um, into really owning my software skills. Uh, like I said, I think I have a, I have a lot of infrastructure experience. Um, so, you know, it's just it's something new. I think it's something fun. I would do some cool stuff with. Mm -hmm. Yep. Lots of languages. Don't need to know them all. Yes. Um, oh yeah. I've seen, I I've, um, I've seen that Udemy course, uh, 325 lk um, yes, I also recommend, um, I, I, again, for cloud, I highly recommend a cloud guru. I really do. Um, it's, 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 a, it's pretty good. You can also get their stuff. If you don't want to pay the monthly fee for that, usually their courses are on Udemy as well. 
Uh, but yeah, all the resources you can find, check them out. Start with one language, learn it really well. Uh, yeah, so I do want to be clear that like, I do, I do recommend that you learn that like when you are, I recommend you understand the concepts first, uh, cause I think it'll help you learn the language faster. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would also like, I don't like, don't be a extreme generalist. Like I, because my, I'm not a software engineer. Um, I, I am a little more of a generalist in some of these languages. Uh, while we are spending time learning different languages now, I do recommend that you take one of these and you focus on it. Um, that you do learn one really well that can be your bread and butter uh, because then it will give you a, a, not only will one, it make you super marketable to any jobs that want to do that. And you'll be, you know, light years ahead of a lot of other people, but it will help you have a basis of understanding other languages as well. Like once you understand one really well, um, it's easier to apply some of those deeper concepts uh, in another language or just kind of, uh, pick up, you know, some of the more technical concepts. Um, so yeah, I'm not saying, Hey, learn all these languages and just understand the concepts and all of them. Like you should definitely dive into to one. But, uh, I think right now for this course, uh, I think you'll have a good time uh, for how long this course is too. like at only eight weeks. Um, I think it'll really give you a, a little boost to have seen so many of these and it'll help you know what language you want to start learning. I like Python before go, but I'm not going to Python anytime soon. Um, I mean, goes great. I like it. How do you recommend learning both at the same time? Uh, yes. So I, so yes, yeah, so there are two different, there are two different aspects to the learning, learning the languages. There's the conceptual learning. So understanding what you're doing, um, the, the, what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, or the way you're doing and why you're doing it versus the, how you're doing it. Uh, so I think most people go into programming, learning the syntax, uh, and learning how to do a specific task to learn how to do something. Um, but they don't really understand why they're doing it. So when I say learning both again, the concept, when we talk about the concept of a variable, the way that I have some of this broken down is we're going to learn about, oh, I don't know why I can't click on this, <laughs> but, uh, the concepts of variables, um, variables exist across all of them uh, across all programming languages. Um, and so maybe, maybe, um, maybe you should take on a main language. Maybe you might say, Hey, uh, Python is what I'm going to focus on, even though I'm going to be learning a little bit with go as well. Um, but when you learn the, co the conceptual items, understanding what a variable is, this is not a programming language specific concept. And a lot of people never, uh, a lot of people, it takes them a while to understand, like they, they're like, Oh, I can make a variable in Python. And like, they know how to do that thing. Uh, but they never, they've never thought about a variable conceptually. Um, and so when you get to new language, uh, it can be a little confusing sometimes. So I'm talking about uh, un like learning those concepts in tandem across languages. Again, the syntax, uh, I, I've already told you, I wouldn't focus on syntax at all. Um, but when you're learning, so if you're trying to learn one specific language, yes, focus on that specific syntax, uh, in that one language, but I would look at very like, like we did tonight variables take a look at them in a couple different languages uh when you get to the un like the understanding of string interpolation yes maybe we'll use python to learn that concept but i think it submits the concept when you see it in more than one paradigm when you see it done in another place uh it, it may take off some of the preconceived things that you were thinking it may take off some of the things that you didn't know uh, by kind of seeing this down another way another way uh, and again the the other reason why i recommend people learn a statically typed language along with a dynamically typed language is because all concepts, uh, like all the like programming concepts, there are different programming concepts uh, between the two languages. Um, and I actually think it's easier. And again, it's maybe be different for you. I think it's easier to learn them in tandem um, than to learn one. I, I, I know people who are amazing JavaScript developers who refused to move to who had tons of trouble trying to learn a statically type language uh, because the concept because they were good at one thing and now these very completely new concepts are being brought up and they did they just didn't conceptually uh they've already learned all the, the weird uh muscle memory things and they've picked up some relatively bad habits because javascript will allow you to do that uh, and it makes it tough to kind of pick up those things if you're going to learn one first so that doesn't happen um, if you really want to focus on one first, I recommend you focus on a, a statically typed compiled language like go like Java. But again, there's more concepts there. It doesn't allow you as much freedom. So if the goal is to really learn this stuff, go 
compiled, statically typed. Pick something like Go or Java or C Sharp. If your goal is to get a job um, and, and to start to pick up the skills necessary just to get a job, again, you can do that with both, but I think for most people, it will be faster uh, and more and more immediately rewarding to do it with a dynamically typed language like Python or JavaScript. That is as honest as I can be about it. Um, I'm sure people feel differently. Share your feelings on that. Um, feel free to share your feelings on that. What I'm saying is not, uh, it's not the gospel. It is just my interpretation of the industry. Is the degree worth it for people changing careers? No, 100%, I'll tell you right now, it is not worth it. Uh, while I think degrees, uh, this, this, I, I'm not someone who thinks degrees hold no value. The degree does hold value. I also think it depends on where you're located in the world as well, because um, they mean different things in different places of the world. But the tech industry in the United States, the tech industry that I'm most familiar with, you do not need a degree. I do not recommend you to get a degree. It will cost you much more money. Um, it'll cost you a lot of money to not get the industry experience that you need. Um, be, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. Tech changes super fast. It's hard for organizations and schools to keep up. Um, and it's hard for people to contextualize what this stuff is. I can't tell you, I like, I, there are plenty of people who teach um, that cannot implement. Um, that is a, it's a fact. I've had conversations with uh, computer science um, teachers who, um, who when we talked about the implementation of uh, certain things, um, it was very interesting to, to see their, to see their, they had the, they had the, they had the, uh, the right, they had the textbook ideas, um, but um, the real world application that really tells you something, and there are some caveats to a lot of things, uh, those best practices and things aren't always the best practice. Uh, they're, they're the best practice in an ideal condition. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. So I don't know, the, the academic space for tech is, uh, it's an interesting one in, in my opinion, but I do not think you need to do that unless you can go to school for free. If you go for free, I say do it. Money's a factor. If you gotta pay for it and then, you know, I I say don't do it. Being so good is one thing. Do you think being so good in one thing is good or bad thing? I feel learning a lot of variety of stuff isn't that good, especially for a beginner. Great, that is a phenomenal question, WXAAZ. I know we're over time, sorry about that. You can, uh, we're just answering questions now. So if you need to go, feel free to head out. Nothing more today, um, but yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think in the beginning, uh, I think early on, I really think you need to be, uh, I think you need to have a broad level of knowledge. I think after you get a broad understanding of a number of concepts, then you specialize. The reason I say that is because all, all this tech, touches each other. You can be a pro at Python, but if you if you don't understand how an application is served and you don't understand how the internet works and you don't know how um, users are consuming this information, your usefulness of knowing Python as a language is, uh, is not all that useful. Um, and it, it'll make you, uh, like at, in today's age, at least what I'm saying, the engine, engineering roles are kind of converging a little bit. Everyone uh, has to know a little bit more, not, I wouldn't say more information, but everyone needs to know a little more about the process. Uh, so yes, I think in the beginning, I think early on, uh, you need to spend time getting a broad level of of, of topics under your, underneath your belt. So even just a software developer, think back to the things that you need. You need some command line experience. That's the reason why I taught you the little bit of Linux. All developers need to need some command line experience, whether you're on uh, you know Mac or PC doing something on PC instead, you need some command line experience. And again, web developers need to understand how the internet works, how, you know, uh, data is transferred across a lot of different things. There's a there's a lot of underlying concepts um, underneath here. You don't need to know every programming language, but your data, your your you need to be broad at first and then specialize. Uh, I will. That is that's my viewpoint on that. I will stand on that um, because I've heard people say, "Hey, specialize in this, specialize in that." I think when you do that out the gate, um, I think you'd never even get that good at the thing you're specializing in because you need to contextualize that speciality with uh, the rest of the industry. You need to know where it fits in uh, to be able to do that thing, um, you know, well. Will the first episode be available to watch? Yeah, um, they do start at seven. Uh, the first episode is available to watch. Oh, um, if you're talking about the Python one, the, I mean, the pipelines one, that one's at 10 a.m. on Saturdays, but yeah, they're all on, uh, they're all on YouTube currently already. Um, yesterday's is not, uh, it goes up tonight, um, 24 hours after. Um, so yeah.
Um, and that's not the first one, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Linux Academy is dope. I use Wiz Labs. It's much cheaper. Everyone, everyone who's taken the AWS course, um, I have a Wiz Labs. I have a Wiz Labs affiliate code. Uh, Wiz Labs is dope. I use Wiz Labs. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on here one day. You know, my goal. I'm not super pressed about that stuff, but uh, I'll get it up here one day. But Wiz Labs is good. It is a site that helps you study for the exams. Um, pretty cheap as well. Um, it's like twenty something dollars to get like a set of exams, practice exams. But yeah, but I'll also give you guys a number of practice questions. I'm trying to put together. So here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put together some practice exams. Well, what I'm really trying to do, sorry, that was weird. I'm really trying to get you to me to give me a number of practice exams to give out for um, the A Cloud Guru ones because they have a number of their practice exams on there. I'm working on that right now. We'll see what they do. Um, Cause you know, I, I, think, I think a lot of these resources should be free but not for a cloud guru because you know their company i get it uh and they offer a dope product but again cash is tight you know 30 dollars a month is not nothing at all so and programming and also the cloud which course would both of these encompass so if you're if you're interested in programming and the cloud molo uh that's all that's really all the courses it's literally uh for the week it's literally cloud programming cloud programming and then on saturdays uh it's um, it's really programming um, to implement solutions in the cloud. That's really what the pipelines one is. Uh, so yeah, so kind of all of them kind of weird, but ev like everything is the cloud and software right now. It's like, it's all there really is anymore. Uh, let's see. First and second. Yeah, they should be there. But yeah, everyone does learn it individually. Like, yeah. I should be more clear about that when I'm saying some things I'm only giving you uh, if you know. So one of the biggest things I, I should put in there as well, like I put I want you to learn new con like learn how to learn new concepts, but also I want you to learn how you like to learn. Maybe you'll start going through this course and maybe I'll give you a some type of article or something you'll read through and you'll be like, okay, I get it this way. And you'll learn that the way that you uh, learn best is either kinetic or auditory or, you know, uh, there's different ways of learning. I'll, you got to learn how you learn best. Um, I find that I used to learn best through videos, um, until, um, you know, I started to dive into deeper things and those videos weren't working for me anymore. Um, and I needed to just I, like, I'm a, I, I learned through kinetically through doing, um, and through, through visuals. Um, and yes, you might say that's a video, but videos are actually too, they're too slow for me. Uh, my mind, the problem is the whole time a video is running, my mind is starting to connect things. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this thing that I already know. And I'm thinking about how this works with this. And, and then I miss 40 seconds of the video. Uh, and so it's tough. So I've actually pulled away from watching, um, a number of videos. Uh, for some of the topics, um, I, I you know, I hit up YouTube all the time to learn little things, but when the topic is large, I actually don't like to do it that way anymore. Um, so yeah, you gotta learn how you like to learn. So if I say something, just an opinion, unless I, unless I declare it to be factual. And hopefully you can hear sometimes when I say that as a fact, like I'm the tallest person in the world at 274 centimeters, which I don't even think is the tallest person, but maybe it is. Uh, you know, that's not a fact. That is just me being a jokester. Uh, let's see what math do you need to be a software engineer to be hundred percent honest with you. It all depends on what job you take. Um, but I'll be honest, uh, the amount of math that we've needed on my current position is almost basic addition and subtraction is if you can add, subtract, multiply and divide, you're probably fine at most places. Um, at, at most places, again, there are, there are jobs that require a higher level of thinking. Most of them are pretty simple. Mm. Waiting for the government to give all your student loans. I agree with you. Uh, I think government should, uh, let's just, let's just start over. Let's just, let's just start all the way over. I major in aviation dope. Remember if you were part of the first one, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I wanted to go to, uh, uh, what is it? Not full sale. I want to go to Embry riddle and I wanted to go to another, there was another school in the South that was, uh, aviation focused that I wanted to go to, but I got scholarships to a different school. So I went there. Um, no background at all. And I'm in the process of changing careers, teaching yourself. I agree with others really helpful. Yeah. Um, so the problem, the one problem, ah, maybe there's a good time to bring it back up. 
the main problem with all the resources that are available online right now is it's hard to know what to do next. It's hard to parse through. We started during Operation Quarantine a few weeks ago. We were, uh, we tried to take a week and we tried to build this application. Uh, there's a repo for it, but um, because of that, um, I'm trying to put together basically a um, an open source website. Um, we we actually got pretty far with the back end um, to where you could where people can start to uh, curate these things. So like if I'm someone who's an expert at uh, machine learning. Um, there's a bunch of free information that's already out there. There's the YouTube videos, there's articles, all the stuff is there, but like, how do you put it together in a way that like, means that when I go through this information, the order, all that stuff that I, I you know, I'm working towards learning, you know, uh, uh, machine learning. Um, and so maybe someone who knows, who knows that can put that together, can pull that information together and create courses through GitHub. Uh, well, they would, they would be submitted through GitHub and they would actually be built out into a front end using a static site generator where uh, it would kind of take you through these course tracks. We'll get back to it another day. Um, we're gonna, we are gonna finish that though. But um, yeah, all the information's out here. It's hard to put it together, but um, I'm glad, I, you know, for all the people changing careers, it's it's not easy. It is, it is not easy. But at the same time, I promise you, if you just spend the time around it, um, if you just spend the time looking at the stuff and thinking about it, it'll come, it'll come faster than you think. Um, and it's basically, if you spend the time it's guaranteed money it's guaranteed jobs. Like it's not one of the, it's not one of those industries where like, yes, there are like, you hear stories about people quitting the industry and, and doing terrible here, doing terrible there. Yes. There are jobs where you need to be a the best. There, there are jobs where you actually need to be a, you know, a rocket scientist to do those jobs. Yes. Working for Netflix or Google, you may be doing something where you need to be very intelligent. There are a billion uh, government contractors where you need to know how to uh, turn on your computer and you know uh, change some lines of HTML and maybe change some JavaScript and they'll pay you a lot for it. There's a tons of companies who need you to keep a website up. There's a tons of companies who need you to do uh, fairly simple things to someone who's been studying these things, but maybe too hard for other people to do. So you can find you can find a place for you. You don't have to be great. You don't, you really don't have to be great. Yes, you want to work at Google. If you want to work at Microsoft, if you want to work at one of the fan companies or out west, maybe maybe you have to be good. I can promise you, I can point you to forty five jobs where you have to know the bare minimum. So yeah, don't uh, don't stress. Don't stress. Like I hate, I hate when I go online. I hate when I go on YouTube and all the people are like, you gotta learn all these, uh, all these, all these algorithms. No, I don't know how to you know, reverse the binary tree and traverse it and do this. And that's like, man, look, the place I work, fearless, pretty dope place. Uh, we come in and we have you have a, we have a conversation about you about tech. You come in, we we let, we base the interview off of your conversation. Might ask you a few. No questions. You won't do any white. You won't do any whiteboarding. At least last I knew, you don't do any whiteboarding. Uh, you don't need to know any of those crazy algorithms, just because that's not a requirement. Like I've never had to use those algorithmic solutions on anything yet. And like I said, I've been a part of writing a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of things that people have used heavily, and none of that stuff really mattered. Yeah, so we're about to raise someone. I was trying to go through the questions, but we are yeah we're way over time. Check out CW alone on YouTube. I'll check it out. I'll definitely check it out. That that, uh, that gets me excited. How much time do you think we need to spend learning before applying to a job? So MG, I think that depends on how much previous previous experience you have. If you have absolutely no experience, um, a lot, <laughs> um, really like a lot of time. Um, you know, people go to these coding boot camps for eighteen months full time, um, and you know have have trouble. Um, I think these boot camps are a little bit more interesting because it's not purely like this one is not purely a full stack development course. Um, so uh, at the end of this course, you won't be able to go get a software and just go get a software job, uh, but you'll be on the right path. But the tools that you can combine from all of them, understanding a little bit about the cloud, understanding a little bit about programming, understanding a little bit about systems and, and how the software development lifecycle works. Um, you know, I think, I think a couple months, um, completely fresh. I think you can start to find jobs that you are absolutely equipped for. All right. That shit was giving me nightwares. Um, cool. All right, Mickey. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Who are we raiding tonight? Who are we heading over to see long stream? 
everyone have a good night who are we heading over to see let's see twitch that tv let's see who's on browse i'm not even logged in so i can't see any of my peeps um where's science and tech resources that will help us interview questions yeah uh i can i can definitely share uh some of those resources uh we went over some of them in the beginning one is exorcism.io uh which will help um uh, uh, project uh, euler it's spelled e project euler uh, but there's also some things like um uh what is it i don't want to give you the bad one i don't want to give you the stolen one i want to give you the what's it this algo pro and algo expert I think it's algo pro is the one you want and not algo expert let me see one's by the tech lead one's by one was stolen by the tech lead hold on let me see let me see real quick algo expert or algo pro which one is it night the wax ass yeah i think it's algo expert algo expert's good um it's a little bit costly but you get it for life i think um, and it goes through all of those crazy things. So check that out. Um, or I'll go pro. I really don't know which one's which, but I know I used, I used one for a little while and they're very good. Um, they're definitely very good, but cool. Who are we rating? Let's head over to, so let's, let's, uh, let's rate someone smaller tonight. Um, let's see what we got. Hmm. Preferably someone who trying to see if there's anything related. This person's learning Rust, and they're not smaller. They're they're. I was when I was saying smaller. I was saying someone like seven. But uh, this person's learning Rust and building a poker game. So let's head over to the code show. I don't know anything about this guy stream. So if you get in there and it calls y'all stupid, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Like I didn't mean for him to hurt your feelings. I don't know this person, but it's gonna be fun let's see code show all right so tomorrow is horizons we're gonna be diving into ec2 elastic compute cloud uh tomorrow we're gonna be hands-on we're gonna be building servers out tomorrow uh putting some of that linux stuff that we learned here to good use um and on wednesday uh i mean what's today monday on oh, today's tuesday on thursday we will be no on what is today hey monday what is it Today is Tuesday. So on Thursday, we will be learning. Uh, where's the Notion tab? We were already there. I don't know. We'll be learning something on Notion. I mean, we'll be learning something on Thursday. I can't remember what it was. Uh, this is bothering me. Hold on. I have to see what it is. Variables, variables, displaying output. Uh, and we'll be learning about Git. That's on, that's, on, uh, that's on Thursday. That'll be a good day. But cool. Let's head over. Say hi. And I will, I will get some rest. No! Mastermind used raid coach. Oh, no, it did work, it did work. Appreciate you posting those things in Slack. Um, yeah, thanks. All right, everybody, we are out. See you, see you tomorrow.